is presently he is going to discuss exotic materials discovery for clean energy storage and environment applications dr sesa please start your lecture thank you okay let me All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is for us. It's a good morning, and some countries maybe good night. Uh, it's close to a different time zone. And thank you for all of us to join in this uh, uh, first of its attempt. International webinar on material synthesis and characterization during this very difficult time of COVID-19. Um, as a first speaker of this presentation, I would like to touch upon about what our efforts working on exotic materials discovery for clean energy storage and the environmental applications. What you see on this screen is our university campus. Uh, this is an innovation science and technology campus. We do offer cutting edge curriculum for masters and PhD students. I'm the chair of the natural science department working with the physics, chemistry and biology. We do have a strong material science mechanical engineering program. With that introduction, I would like to start. Um, so this is um, I'm sorry. This is my first uh, research group working on different projects. Uh, primarily, we work with undergraduate research students and uh, one or two graduate students to work on. Uh, so we develop over time number of materials for energy storage, uh, environmental remediations, and also now we are working on thermal energy storage and uh, diesel engines. How we can make uh, diesel engines very efficient by using your um, different uh, technology, using cool, cool particulate technology. So these are our, some students graduated, some students are currently with us, and uh, we also have with two faculty right now online, Professor Fouad and the Professor Ajit Kaushik. Um, so it's a great opportunity to introduce our campus and students' efforts in this presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the outline about novel materials classifications, synthesis characterization, structure property, and summary of my research and future research. Uh, overall, it's a material synthesis, a vast experiencing area, a most demanding area for number of different applications, you name it, from the manufacturing of a little boat pin all the way to the big, huge cranes. There are materials available, materials need to be explored for replacing for sustainability. So number of materials we have looked into in the past, the materials are classified into different categories. It could be metals and alloys or oxides and hydrides, composites, polymers, nanoparticles. And uh, uh, recently we started looking on carbonates and we also working on some of the uh, soft materials. Uh, in the metal alloy category, we use primarily the base metals and alloys for synthesizing to store hydrogen and many thermal energy purposes. Oxides we use for photocatalysis and uh, photo uh, production re reduction as well as photo oxidation processes. Composites and polymers we develop over time for uh, hydrogen storage and also for uh, sensors applications, nano crystalline, nano, uh, uh, nanotube, graphenes, and graphene oxide composites, we have developed for different, different applications. In addition to our carbonate materials, we also developed recently the oxides for thermochromic applications, which is not in here, that is under progress. 
Uh, overall, for a material uh, process, you need to know about the how to make the material, how to make it without what is the appropriate technique so that you can pre prepare your uh, synthesis of the materials in a proper way. Once you synthesize the material, then is that a way that your your material, what you produce, is? Hello, sir. Ah, yes. Continue. Okay. You have to tell me when to stop. That way I can stop it. Um, uh, 25 minutes probably. Uh, the synthesis will follow with the characterization. The characterization will be different characterization tools. Uh, you name it like X-ray diffraction, electron diffraction, neutron scattering, uh, scanning, and all kind of uh, different characterization methodologies which we apply for our materials proper uh, to know that materials are synthesized correctly and then work on the property measurements, which is very much needed for your applications. So this is a, a strategy what we follow. Uh, overall, the application research is very needed for now because now the pandemic or COVID-19, well, what kind of materials can survive or can identify the viruses those kind of application driven is very much needed. So we put our application into the storage, energy storage or um, biomedical or uh, wastewater remediation or uh, the solar energy applications and uh, hydrogen production fuel cells applications. Um, the first material what I'm going to show it's my PhD work. It's a, it was phenomenal when always you start working on the first time in the lab to try to use some of the thing which always you keep it in wherever you're going that will come with you. So this is my PhD work where we started ma ma making the alloy fabrication. We use a melting, arc melting and radio frequency induction melting to make a material. What I show you is there's a two component systems. One is a magnesium pellet and a um, uh, rare alloy. So magnesium is a subliming property. So it was sublime, whereas uh, the another alloy will not sublime, but will melt at very high temperature. So uh, this was a job done at a BHU with a professor Oyen Suvastva, Padma Sri Professor Oyen Suvastva. So, and then we try to characterize this materials in terms of XRD and then the SEM as well as your hydrogen storage characteristics. Um, what you see is whenever you make a material alloy, it could be a bulk material, but you can also pulverize it, pulverize it and hydrogenate it. Therefore, you can create a lot of uh, pores and cracks so that you can store hydrogen. So that's a material modification what we did. The second material is about complex materials, where we have a subliming magnesium hydride and iron complex that won't make an intermetallic alloy, whereas it will make under the presence of hydrogen. So for that, I need to choose a different technique. This is called the attitude ball milling, where I could use a hydrogen as a pressure of 10 bars and then try to make this material. We were the first reported single phase compound magnesium ion hydride of uh, uh, that was reported and it was validated by our uh, professor Viziraglu from USA. So, and then you can add your nano crystalline version or the uh, uh, catalyst version, you can improve the kinetics of this material. So I'm just skimming through that way, these are all very old work, but still it's a very nascent to people who are citing all the references. When you take the crystalline solid, the blue line of XRD, which shows a highly crystalline peak, uh, the red line is a highly crystalline of magnesium. I can also use a ball milling in a, a system, planetary ball milling, where I can reduce the particle size, full width of maximum is increasing, so that I can produce a nano crystalline version, which is published in 2020, uh, Applied Sciences, that shows that the kinetics and the thermodynamics of these systems, you can see that the temperature reduction from bulk about 400 degree all the way to 300 degrees C by using nano crystalline version of the materials. All right. So 
the second material what we have developed over time with a collaboration with the uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. This is called nano sponges. Nano sponges of uh, palladium, silver, copper. We look into all the metals, make it as a nano sponge by using a chemical route, just uh, using uh, the salt solution and then try to work with the amino borane. The amino borane compounds and produce a porous nano sponges. The reason to produce a nano sponge is again, if you look at the SEM or uh, uh, TEM or HRTEM, we could see that the nano particleization of this, and also you can see the very nice elemental composition of this. Uh, overall, the goal for this material is to improve the kinetics and uh, storage capacity of a bulk palladium. Like a bulk palladium and nano sponge palladium will behave differently. And you will see that the SCM picture of a before and after PCT that shows that the, the nano crystalline version have a more capacity of storing hydrogen with a fast kinetics. So that's one type of materials what we develop. Then we develop a system which is called complex hydride. The complex hydride is called sodium aluminum hydride which could go into two different steps of uh, releasing hydrogen. One is a uh, hexahydride, tetrahydride to hexahydride, and then finally sodium hydride. So this was um, in situ hydrogen de dehydrogenation, hydrogenation was done at uh, Brookhaven National Lab to look for the hydrogenation and dehydrogenation XRD and to see that how the phases are evolving and phases are uh, going uh, going away. So that is called in situ X-ray diffraction to see that the phase analysis of different phases under the hydrogen pressure. And also we try to see that our, our material synthesize or having withstand up to 100 or even 1000 cycles of hydrogen back and forth. We try to use a synchrotron source from uh, Oslo, Norway to look at the more crystallinity and aluminum titanium alloy in these phases. So this was again of my postdoc work. Uh, then uh, after my uh, life at the uh, University of South Florida, we patented two patents on this methods of storing hydrogen and also nanotechnology enable hydrogen storage. This was uh, highly adopted in many of the companies. Uh, in this uh, patterns, we try to make the buck material nano crystalline using planetary ball milling and then nano catalyst dope. That means we will use a catalyst to doping so that you can improve the thermodynamics and also kinetics. The thermodynamics I can decrease from 82 uh, kilojoules per mole to 61 kilojoules per mole and the kinetics is improved by 10 times. So I use a different materials like um, this composite system to make. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all the chemistries and uh, st structure synthesis, but for PhD students and uh, research scholars, I would like to say that this is the way you look into the synthesis process of materials you try to put into a schematic or a scheme and work around that scheme and to see which process may uh, go into the next level for characterization validation. So our goal was to increase or decrease the activation energy of the materials. We tried to shop around five different processes and then the, uh, one process we chose it to get, get the lower activation energy. Again, this is a little detail. Uh, you also look into more like a thermal program desorption to see the hydrogen desorption over the different types of mechanisms. I wanted to point out how the X-ray diffraction is very useful in quantifying an aerosols. What you see that we did a systematic X-ray diffraction for all the five different materials and then put, put it in an Excel chart to see that these materials hydrogen concentration with the particle size. If you go with the particle size reduction, I have a little window, like on your right, you see 28 nanometers of one component and 9.2 nanometers of another component. If they have a certain particle size, 
then I can improve my storage capacity or any other property. So my goal is to decrease the activation energy and increase the uh, uh, hydrogen capacity by doing the particleization or nanoparticle formation. And uh, at the National Institute of uh, Science and Technology in Maryland, we try to do the rehydrogenation of this sample by micro Raman. This is again in situ hydrogen pressure micro Raman to look for whether my face is getting growing back. On your right side, you see the rehydrogenation. I see the Raman peaks are growing up. That shows that I'm producing a reversible hydride that was patented uh, in 2012 and 2013. And then we try to look for the cyclic stability of these materials. Uh, we also try to throw some nano catalysts like a nano iron nickel catalyst or iron cobalt copper like that. We try to look for the kinetics of the reaction and cycle life. Uh, and then uh, my professor uh, Owen Suvastava has published a paper in 2005 uh, looking for the carbon nanotubes impact on the complex borohydrates and complex aluminum hydride, we propose the mechanism to have a nanotubular as well as nano particle structure so that you can have a better transport of hydrogen. At the same time, you can have a better reversible hydrogen behavior. Uh, one of the material we look into, sometimes these materials may have two gases released. One is hydrogen. And the second one is uh, ammonia. Ammonia is not good for the fuel cells because it will poison the membrane, whereas hydrogen is good. We wanted to suppress the ammonia by doing some kind of optimization. What I want to show that uh, we try to do different material synthesis and optimization and look for uh, the, the, fourth, the fourth figure on the bottom from left you will see the hydrogen to ammonia peak is going down. So that we wanted to see that having the uh, mixing of a single wall carbon nanotubes with a ruthenium catalyst of 20%, we could able to reduce or suppress the ammonium so, so that you can increase your hydrogen desorption characteristics. So th this is the way one has to look for how to optimize it by using material synthesis and then characterize it so that you can know that where is the optimum for getting your applications. Um, so this is the process we were closely looking to having a ruthenium as well as single wall carbon nanotubes. Look for the hydrogen peak, which is uh, increasing the red and then the ammonia is uh, decreasing and uh, the green peak is uh, growing that's called nitrogen so ammonia is cracking down into nitrogen and uh, hydrogen so that you can use more hydrogen less ammonia that's good for your fuel cell uh, vehicle applications uh, then the, the soft material we look into that's called polymer nanostructures polyanilin and poly uh, polyanilin nanospheres and nanofibers uh, we try to prefer using a template-less and template process, uh, nanosphere with a chemical route. And looking to this hydrogen storage on this porous nanostructures, we could able to get up to 3% of hydrogen at room temperature. That's unheard of. Like we, uh, we got the cycling capacity, we got improved the storage capacity, but there is an intrinsic problem with the reversibility sometimes. If we go for nanofibers by electro spinning, then we also seen up to 10% hydrogen uptake, but the, over a time, the capacity goes down. So we are developing the uh, PANI or polyanilin nanofibers for even now with the electrochromic and thermochromic applications. Uh, one of the, I want to switch over from storage to the wastewater remediation using catalyst. Photocatalyst, which is used for wastewater remediation, uh, we got a funded project for that. And liquid fuel production, you can use um, uh, photocatalysis so that you can produce a biofuel or a hydrogen production or any uh, photocatalyst, uh, magnetic photo nanoparticles can use for the early diagnosis of cancer. Uh, in this project, we work on the uh, zinc doped titanium dioxide and zinc iron oxide. 
So the zinc doped titanium dioxide, you could ever tell the titanium dioxide, as you know that the absorption, UV absorption is about 390 nanometers. Whereas if you go with the zinc doped uh, titanium dioxide, you can shift your band gap or probably you can shift your absorption band to uh, the visible light. That's good for visible activated photocatalyst. So we use a HRTEM and AFM techniques to characterize these materials for our applications. Uh, the second thing is on the band gap, because as a solid state physicist and material chemistry people, that adjusting the band gap is a huge challenge. How can you adjust your bulk property of the band gap engineering so that you can work on the, the shift of the electromagnetic spectrum? You can either go to the blue shift or the anomalous or red shift by adjusting the band gap, you go with the wavelength changes. So this is again a project where we use a bulk commercial zinc ion oxide and try to ball it for 72 hours up to, then we try to correlate the band gap with the crystal light size. The crystal light size goes down from 200 to 10 nanometer. The band gap is go down as well from 2.7 electron volt to 2.3 electron volt. Uh, we did this process with the wet ball milling or a dry ball milling, trying to adjust the band gap so that you can work suitably for your either the hydrogen production or the, the wastewater photocatalytic oxidation treatment. The next project is about nitrogen doped titanium dioxide. We use the nitrogen coming from the ammonia. So the nitrogen is doped on the titanium dioxide. So that, and then we try to make it as a thermochemical treatment and you try to use that to find out the absorption bands. The absorption bands are spreading up to 450 nanometers. That shows that it could be visible light activated photocatalyst. And what you see at the bottom of the, this is a photo batch reactor, but at the bottom of the figure, you will see with the um, uh, untreated and treated photocatalyst, you see the, Water treatment is very successful in about uh, about few hours. And one of the projects we involve with the uh, photo oxidation of your organic uh, pathogens or bacteria or viruses within the chamber. Uh, this is again could be useful for in the for a photocatalyst and detoxification. And where we develop this uh, patented, this is a file for patented. Uh, for uh, killing the bacteria or pathogens, or even in fact, we can try with the COVID-19 for uh, using the photocatalyst and the solar light so that we can work on the efficiently degrade or kill the bacteria or viruses. Uh, with that introduction, I would like to acknowledge uh, my university, Florida Polytechnic University, uh, because I, I quickly skimmed through but I could take more questions. If it is, then probably I can fill in the time. Dr. Terry Parker, Dr. Tell and Nicoletta, Dr. Terry Parker is our provost. Uh, provost is uh, close to the uh, uh, pro vice chancellor in India. Dr. Nicoletta Hickman, our division director, University of South Florida, Professor Elias Stefanakis, who is our postdoc mentor, and then I still collaborate with him. Florida Industrial Passport Research, Lately, we started a funded project on the dolomites, which is a phosphate mining product. We use it for thermochemical energy storage. Due to the limitation, I was working all over last night. I couldn't get the time to put on those two slides, uh, but we are funded. And then that project was about how you can store the carbon dioxide uh, sequester and capture in a earth abundant material. That was the one which is uh, shown promising that the calcium magnesium carbonate, which can store the carbon dioxide and use it for your power plants. Uh, we also work with the, the US Department of Energy, National Science Foundation projects, Office of Naval Research, Florida Energy Systems Consortium, Hinkley Center for Solid and Waste, Hazardous Waste Management, and our recent project, which ended is, uh, with the Punjab University, which is Indo-US Partnership Grant on Green Chemistry, Engineering, and Technologies. We floated three conferences. We successfully co completed three international conferences. Um, 
so with that i would like to uh, close my talk and then i can answer dr sesa yes. thank you for your talk nice talk kindly make anchal srivastav as a panelist he has joined as a attendee as an attendee okay let me do that right uh, okay i will stop my okay so i'm just hold on for a second um okay view attendees i will i'll, I'll put anchal anchal find okay and uh, no. why uh anchal she was the uh professor kiran uh are you listening me uh anchal that's a sub anchal she was the is not finding from the attendee list when i type in He has told that he has joined. He has joined. Uh, then I need to find his name. Okay, Anch. Uh, okay, Achana, Arun, Ashish. Okay. okay, wait a second. Okay, uh, Doctor Binay Kumar has a question. Doctor Varma ji. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, are you listening, me, Professor Sesha? Yes. Yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, 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 we, we are able to know about your work in Hello. great detail. I have one or two Hello. questions. Just a second, sir. Yeah, yeah. And, I, 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 Hello. I'm seeing you working not as a speaker but as an administrator now. Yeah, until BHU, के लिए I have sent you, I've sent him the link again. Uh, why this? As a reminder, okay. Ah, doctor, you are here, or not? Hello. Okay. Sound is not coming. You are sending the link again. Okay. 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 Uh, then, okay. Until B H U, I have to put. Okay. Let me. Uh, until B H U at the rate gmail dot com. Is called auto register. Auto register. As an attendee. Okay. 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 Auto registered. Okay. I'll make him as a panelist. Unmute. I could not make it. He has to come. Yeah, he is auto register. Uh, yes. Auto registered. Yeah, but I try to click as a panelist is not uh, working. Can he come um, with the panelist link or the auto register? Why it's not working? He should not. Um, Okay, okay. Let me. Oh, Ashwini Kumar, I can do that. Auto register, I cannot do that. He left. Okay, Professor Binay Kumar. So, uh, some text lecture. Mine, mine is showing A A double A. Double A, okay. Yeah. Oh, double A is. Uh, wait a second. Double A. Yeah, I can see. Uh, until B H U. Yeah, I now can see. Visible. So now I can make Anchal as a presenter. Okay. Anchal, are you ready? Yes. Okay, yes, let me introduce. Let me introduce him. Please. Uh, today the next speaker is Professor Anjali Swarthwa. Uh, 
Doctor, uh, do we have to allow a question or we don't need to allow a question? Don't allow because uh, time is running fast. Okay, fine. So go ahead. If anybody has uh, any question, uh, uh, they can put it in the question answer box. Yes. So today with us, the second speaker, Professor Anjal Srivastava, PhD from BHU. And he is professor at the Department of Physics Institute of Science, BHU. Uh, he has wide uh, experience in the growth and application of carbon and transition metal dichalconogenide based nanomaterials. He has been awarded uh, Max Planck India Fellowship and uh, carried research in Germany. Award also awarded Bicost. Uh, fellowship uh, and work with, worked with Professor P. M. Ajayan at Rice University, USA. Uh, he has visited uh, different foreign countries several times. Uh, uh, his citation is more than 8,000 with H index of 36, I10 index of 67. He has published more than 135 papers in different reputed international journals uh, his present topic is uh, a journey from i to electron microscope a very interesting topic also for the students as well as for faculty so i now invite uh, professor anjal srivastav to start his lecture uh, yes thank you very much uh, I, I'm really very happy to uh, be the part of this. I and Professor uh, Sai Raman, uh, both are uh, my seniors and uh, uh, they are really very good uh, human beings. So both the, 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 both the people who are really uh, great people who helped me a lot in all this uh, journey of my research. Uh, here I uh, I am going to present today uh, my talk, uh, which is a journey from eye to electron microscope. Uh, I am uh, eye to electron microscope. I'm now, my slides are now visible? Yes. Yeah. yes. Perfect. So uh, yeah, so I start from here. Uh, as as you know, I'm 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 working as a professor in Department of Physics, Banaras Hindu University, and uh, uh, the the thing, the topic which uh, really suggests that uh, we we use our eye, which is given by the nature, is uh, is lot of uh, advantage and lot of good things it has. I want to narrate few of things. For example, if you if you talk about our eye. First of, all, first of all, we are able to see each other because of this eye. Nature has given us so beautiful eyes to many of us. And uh, uh, the, the key things which I want as a scientist, I want to talk to you. So you can, you can feel, the, uh, feel the essence of this eye by a few, few very good properties. For example, if you want to teach a class, and in that class, you want to focus on a first student who is sitting very close to you and the last student, you do it in a fraction of a second. So you don't take any second, even, even you don't realize it, that you're focusing from changes from one first student to the last student. And it is all happening so quickly that your brain is analyzing it and seeing very nicely to, to those things. If you, if you see, it has self-cleaning capability. It has self drying, uh, uh, wetting capability. So all these things, which makes the eye so special, so beautiful that uh, without eye, we cannot really think of uh, our life uh, nicely. So, uh, so the question comes here is that if if our eye is so special, we can self focus it, self clean it, self uh, weight is very less, made up of neurons and a very soft material so if everything is good then why we need a 
a, a new uh, scope to see. So scope means the eye is also a scope. So to uh, how why we need a scope? So that even having all good properties, the problem with the eye is that we cannot resolve better than 0.2 millimeter. So if anything which is has smaller than 0.2 millimeter, our eye is unable to resolve it. And that's why we need a better and better system. So the second system, which is made up of um, made up by scientists, is the optical microscope, which which is the second journey. And you see uh, the thing which God or nature has made is so soft, so uh, nice. Uh, but the one which we made as a scientist is a couple of cages. You see the microscope, which has are are having very uh, rugged and uh, made up of uh, metals and all not that soft tea suits and really high and the focusing also you cannot do it so easily you have to do focusing by your own and things like that and it takes time so so whenever i ask my student that if you want to see if god has given or nature has given this opportunity to see better than 0.2 millimeter or even micron sizes then what is the problem? When a very interesting answer came by one of my students, which I really want to narrate here is that, sir, we cannot eat curd because we have a lot of bacteria and that then this bacteria will, I, we can see and therefore it is very difficult to eat, eat, uh, eat this curd. Anyway, so these are the things we can even see on our farm, a lot of bacteria and viruses. But anyway, so these are the things which is required for better and better uh, uh, imaging. So resolution is the issue. Optical, after optical microscope, people realize that we cannot see better than micron. And if you want to see viruses and bacteria, which is a nanometer, um, uh, bacteria in micron and uh, viruses are in nanometer, therefore are even atoms and things like that. If you want to see, we need a new microscope. And this microscope is known as electron microscope. So electron microscope uh, works, how it works. The, the question comes here is that how it works. Uh, the principles are very similar. So I, here I'm talking about a simple uh, uh, process of 10 plus two where a lens works. So you know, when you have an object, you can see in the diagram that when you have an object and you have a lens, then you get a real image. It means that even in the eye, you, you, you need a lens, even in an optical microscope, you need a lens. Even in a transmission electron, you need a lens to image a, a, to image this uh, object. So therefore, the first thing which is very important is we need a lens. This is the first requirement. Then, if we need a lens, then uh, what is the problem with the uh, optical microscope? that uh, we, we, we told. As I told you that this is the resolution. So here in this slide, I want to talk about uh, resolution and what uh, try to explain you that by uh, optical microscope means the wavelength is 400 angstrom to 600 angstrom somewhere from blue to red region. Definitely we need uh, wavelength is fixed and therefore by relay criteria, we can resolve uh, not more than 400 uh, nanometer in ideal case because the limit of resolution which is 0.61 lambda which is the lambda is the wavelength of the light which you are using by sine alpha and sine alpha is, alpha is nothing but the aperture so sine alpha maximum you can put one therefore uh, this value will uh, if you want to calculate for blue which is the the lowest lambda then limit of resolution is, uh, is fixed or uh, depend on the lambda and therefore it is fixed. So the question comes is that if the, so if you want to resolve better and better, we need a lower and lower wavelength. This is the relay criteria suggestion. So relay criteria suggestion says that if you have a better resolution, if you want a better resolution, you need a, a smaller wavelength. So the question comes here is that optical microscope is electromagnetic radiation. And if it is electromagnetic radiation, the best option with the lower wavelength is X-ray and gamma ray. So because X-ray has a wavelength of one angstrom, gamma ray is similar like that, or even lower than that. So the best, 
best solution for uh, using a, uh, any microscope to develop any microscope uh, with a lower wavelength is either based on X-ray or gamma ray. The question is that why? The question is that why electron has been electron has been come up as a microscope, not X-ray and gamma ray. And you can see in the last line, I have written the answer. The answer is that the development of high performance lenses, I told you lens is very important. So the performance of high, high uh, performance lenses necessary to focus the beam to form an image do not X-ray exist for X-ray and gamma ray. So you very effectively, you cannot really focus the gamma ray and X-ray. That is the challenge if anybody can if anybody can come up with a very nice solution of focusing this gamma ray and X-ray, then definitely a, a microscope is also possible to develop through X-ray and gamma ray. So here is the chart. This chart suggests that lower side wavelength are the ultraviolet X-ray and gamma ray. So as I suggested you, that gamma ray or X-ray are the, are the uh, real member for uh, using this uh, um, uh, thing, but electron came in the picture. The next picture which suggests that when you, uh, this suggests that you can use it as a, uh, as a, uh, as a lens, how you can use it. So how electron can be focused. Electron focus means you have, you want to change the path. If you see the lens, what lens does, lens changes the path of the electron, uh, sorry, optical light. So similarly, if you can have any mechanism by which you can change the path of electron, then it is possible to, to make a lens. And therefore, we have studied in our 10 plus 2 that if you apply electron beam and you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to that, electron motion will change and make a circular path. We know this uh, in our 10 plus 2 standard, uh, when you apply a magnetic field, the path of the electron can change. And this will allow you to make a, allow us to make a electromagnetic lenses. So this lenses is not lenses of really glass, but this is with the electromagnetic. So you apply a magnetic field uh, on the electron and you will develop, a, uh, you are able to develop a magnetic field in a coil when you apply a current in a, in a magnetic, uh, in a, in a, in a sonolite kind of situation, then you develop a magnetic field and depending on the strength of the magnetic field, you are in position to really uh, uh, focus the electron based on your need. So this is the uh, advantage of doing that. And this, this thing uh, was uh, understood by Hans Bush. So Hans Bush is focused electron uh, by, uh, by magnetic coils and in 1927. And you see, as soon as they know that electron can be focused uh, there, and then after, uh, just after five years, this two scientists of Ernest Zuska who got the Nobel Prize and Max Nord who is the supervisor. So Ernest Zuska was his student who got the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, Max Nord has been died at the time when this was awarded. So Ernest Zuska uh, from Germany, they, they both are in Berlin. They developed the first microscope uh, after just after five years when they know that electron can be focused. So this is the picture which I want to show you here. It's the lab coat is the Ernest Duska and black coat is the Nord, Max Nord. And they developed in Berlin. This is the image of the first electron microscope. You see this is so raw that uh, they, they just try to develop high uh, magnetic field coils and uh, things like that to see. Uh, how it will really able to image it or not. And the first image which they have taken, they have a resolution of 30 microns. So not very good, but at least they demonstrated that electron can be used as a, as a, uh, as a, as a scope, as a, as a uh, things to see. So uh, a, a student can ask this question that electron we know as a particle, is it right? So how you can use it as a wave? And the same time in 1923, very similar, uh, 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 de Broglie came with the idea that any particle has associated a wave. And this, this was the thesis of de Broglie, very small but very nice uh, uh, things derived by him. And he suggested that lambda is H upon P where uh, H is the Planck constant and uh, lambda is the wavelength and P 
P momentum is your thing. So uh, M is uh, P is MV. So any massive particle has associated a wave. What does it mean? It means that electron, which is really very light particle uh, with a very light mass. This is the difference between the uh, uh, photon, which we are using optical light and here in electron. But anyway, that, that is a different story. Uh, here I want to say that if you accelerate an electron with a high velocity, so if you apply a high voltage like electron volt, 100 kilo electron volt, then you accelerate your electron. Uh, and uh, if I imagine that all, all energy will convert it into the kinetic energy of the electron. So I can correlate this, uh, uh, this relation of EV means the energy which I'm applying, accelerating and converted into the uh, voltage, which is MV uh, and the kinetic energy of the electron, which is half MV square. And if we solve this, then we are end up a, a relation which is uh, about the lambda, about the wavelength. And this is nothing but the constant. You see H is equal to, lambda is equal to H upon 2 MeV. It's all our constant. M is the mass of the electron, E is the charge of the electron, V is the applied voltage which we are doing, or EV is the potential which we are applying. So therefore, we are in position to accelerate our electron to use as a wave. And this wave can be used here is the table. If you apply it, I can, you can see in the third, uh, fourth, where 100 kV, I have written 100 plus 30. Here the wavelength of electron is turned out to be 0 0.307. This is the general, very typical example of 100 kilo volt electron microscope, where the wavelength is now reduced from 4,000 degree, which is in case of, uh, sorry, 4,000 tungsten, which is in the case of opti optical light, is now it is 0 0.037. So you see, 4,000 where is 0 0.03 and not 0 0.01. So it is very nice, a nice um, improvement in wavelengths because we, we, we have studied by relic criteria. If you remember that wavelength is important, lower the wavelength has the resolution. And therefore you are in position by electron microscope to see even in principle atoms. So here I, I want to make a story uh, clear that why electron is the is the candidate for uh, using this. So you use it as a wave. That is one thing by de Broglie equation. You use it, you can focus it, and therefore you can image it. So therefore, uh, electron is the real candidate, and the story goes this way. So as I told you that from story journey from I to electron microscope, how it went from all the way from the nature to this. What happened? What is the difficulty comes? This is the slide which suggests that now, and uh, th that is the proton which is massless. Now electron has some mass. So when you strike, there is a possibility of elastic collision, non-elastic collision, uh, all are possibility. And therefore here is the slide suggests that when you, uh, this red arrow, arrow, which is hitting the sample of green, uh, what will happen? There's a many, many features happen. Many, many, many possibilities are there. So the one which is direct beam, which you are applying, go below a direct beam, which which not interacted actually. There is a possibility that interact elastically. There is a possibility that it uh, interact inelastically. There is a possibility that when you apply electron beams, the X-ray will generate because it's a high electron beam. This is the process of generating X-ray, copper target when you apply electron beam, X-ray will generate. So there's a possibility of generating X-ray. What will, uh, there is the other possibility, possibility of uh, coming secondary electron, characteristics X-ray, visible light, back. So this is the whole slide which talks about the interaction of electron with the sample. So based on each one, for example, the people scientists have developed one instrument. For example, if we talk about the characteristic X-ray, they develop EDX, energy dispersive X-ray analysis. So with the uh, inelastic in scattering and all, uh, electron which is generated, the uh, scanning electron microscope is developed, like secondary electron detection, back scattered electron de detection. These are, by, based on that, scanning electron microscope has been developed. Similarly, the red line, which is even below elastic scattering and non-elastic scattering, which is transmitted, this way transmission electron microscope has been developed. So some are transmitted, some are reflected. So reflected one is the scanning electron microscope, which is the, uh, uh, the secondary electron, backscattered electron or noisy electron. However, the electron which is trans, um, passed through and transmitted 
and so uh, the elastic uh, part this is developed and uh, uh, this is the development of transmission electron micro so this way uh, uh, story started and people has understood that that now we can develop a microscope so here i can show some of the examples as i told you that higher the energy lower the wavelength i have shown the table for 100 kb a, 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 a fight started between the company there is a lot of company came in the picture most companies are philips geol and uh, hitachi these are the company now fei and there many are there so these companies are uh, came at that time and uh, now they started building a higher and high uh, high resolution electron microscope and they know they, they know this fundamental that uh, lower uh, higher the energy if you accelerate better the resolution so you can see this is the electron microscope which is 1.25 million electron volt this is the one um, the left side you can see the the person is sitting on the chair and the whole tank is on the second story so it is a very big microscope they developed and uh, the, 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 the challenge is to see atoms. So these are the things which is going on. And uh, later they realize that when you go for high resolution, there is a variation comes in the picture. These are the few uh, microscope, which is uh, uh, in Hitachi and uh, Philips. This is again a typical example of high, high very high uh, resolution. Uh, microscope with a very high million electron volt and there's a fight between them and they started working on it there's a couple of them has been developed and uh, given to uh, ijima at uh, the lab of japan who, who and there are many very big places because it's very costly later uh, i will show you this is the very general microscope which is in our lab in the banas in the university where we work for uh, like uh, our many of seniors which is participating in the conference has worked this microscope uh, in our uh, laboratory, which is EMCM 12 or 20. The one which is uh, here, the left side, which is written Titan, this is a new kind of microscope. Here I want to show, uh, discuss that, what are the problem with the, the high resolution microscope? Uh, it, the problem is that, uh, the problem is that when you apply a very high uh, potential, the abrasion comes very similar like the abrasion which we have studied is spherical abrasion, chromatic abrasion, very the, we have studied in our 10 plus 2. Similar aberrations also come here and this kills the resolution. So this is the Titan microscope which came with the real-time aberration corrected microscope. It is called real-time aberration corrected microscope. And this microscope actually the software developed and uh, this is uh, developed in Ulm University. In Germany uh, with Ute Kaija and many other scientists uh, they developed this is the example of the one which I am showing you a FEI company Titan microscope uh, this microscope is developed by them and uh, they come with a, a, a real-time aberration correction and then they are in position to map the atoms even summing a storm resolution is possible now uh, so let us see for the research scholar, this slide is very important for the student who are the, what is the difference between electron microscope and uh, a, a light microscope? If you see the wavelength I'm talking, in, uh, this is a comparison table. So if light microscope, it is 400 to 800 nanometer. In electron microscope, it is 0 0.037 angstrom or 0 0.0037 nanometer for 100 kV. Lenses which is used is glass here. But in case of electron microscope, it is electromagnet. I have discussed already. Observation, you can do it direct by your eye, but you cannot do in electron microscope because you cannot see electron. So you have to do the imaging using fluorescent microscope. So electron will hit the fluorescent screen and there a image will pop up and you can see that. Contrast will develop based on absorption, reflection and phase challenges. Uh, changes. However, in case of electron microscope, mostly it is scattering and phase changes and diffraction and resolving power as i told you it is 0.2 micrometer in case of here it is here it is 0.2 nanometer now it is actually sub angstrom so uh, even 0.2 uh, one angstrom uh, focusing uh, is and uh, me mechanically you can do and electron microscope you can do electronically so these are the comparison so why and you see if you do the medium air and i i 
The second point I missed, medium is air, as you see in the light, uh, in the light, uh, light microscope. However, in electron microscope, it is vacuum. This is, the, this is the real problem. Because in, you can use microscope in air, but you cannot use the electron microscope in air because electron will start interacting with uh, your uh, air molecule. Like electron is very small. So uh, it will looks like a cricket ball and a, and a football. So the oxygen will look like a football for him. And this will like a tiny small cricket ball. So it will hit and is scattered. So actually you need a vacuum. Uh, so to visualize, I'm giving this analogy. So in principle, you this analogy is the same. You, here, left side, I have compared the optical microscope and right side, I have compared the electron microscope. S situation is the same, but the thing is that because of the vacuum and because of the lens, different lenses, the story is different. So here you can use any lamp to light, but here you need a electron gun where you can really generate electron gun. Second thing which is important is the lenses. So if you can use optical, uh, uh, in optical microscope, you can use lenses of glass, but here I told you that you have to use it uh, electromagnetic lenses. So there is a condenser lens, then objective lens, then first image lens, then projector lens, and then final image. So this is all things very similar like, similar like the optical microscope, but not exactly similar because here in this case, you have, uh, 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 you need a vacuum, you need an electron gun, you need electromagnetic lenses and uh, and vacuum of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 tar, which is better than if you want better resolution, you need a better and better vacuum. And this is the real challenge to make the microscope always very, uh, very in a very nicer uh, situation where uh, vacuum is always on so that uh, you can uh, do because if your vacuum goes bad, it will take a day to create a nice vacuum so that electron can be accelerated, electron can power can be on, put on. So these are the things. So how uh, this is the cross section of the, the electron microscope I've shown here. If you start from top, it is the gun and uh, from where the electron is accelerated, when let gun and a node is there where you actually apply a very high electric field to accelerate those electrons. Then you have a window, a gun lock. So air lock, if anything goes wrong, it will automatically uh, make the vacuum intact of the gun side, the gun chamber, because if gun with uh, oxygen will go, it is oxidized and your uh, filament will go bad. After that, you have uh, many lenses like condenser lens, which condenser by name itself, it condenses the beam. So when you start a beam, it will go in all, uh, expanding uh, direction, but you want to condense it, you want to focus it where you need a lens, that is the uh, work of the lens, and their condenser lenses make it them parallel. So the one lens will not help, so we actually you use the second lens, so two lenses will make them parallel, then you have a sample holder where you keep your sample, and then you have objective uh, uh, condenser lenses, and many, many things are there. Apertures are there to make a smaller aperture and bigger aperture. So there's a many things there. Uh, so finally, it will come to the uh, 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 condenser, uh, condenser lens, condenser lens, yes, and condenser aperture. Then it will come to the objective lens, and this objective lens will do uh, focus on the back focal plane of all the information will focus on the back focal plane of this condenser lens. And there everything is condensed. Uh, and then you take the small portion where of your interest and you zoom it those area to see magnified image using bionocular or if you can record it through digital uh, plate or through camera, whatever you want. So this is the working of the um, uh, transmission electron microscope. A stream of electron is accelerated. It combines and focuses using metal aperture and magnetic lenses. I told you this is the condenser lenses and uh, intermediate, and then objective lenses, and then intermediate in interaction occurs inside the uh, in sample. So, so you have samples, and their interaction will take place. These interaction and effects are detected uh, and transformed into useful information. So this is the total things which is happening. You see this side, the back side is the vacuum pump and things like that. So, uh, 
So this is important. So this is the same thing here. I don't want to dis, uh, uh, disturb, uh, uh, discuss again. You can see the element filament and all lenses and all. So this is again how image will form. This is the electron ray which will form the image at the uh, screen. So this is the same thing uh, uh, by the ray diagram, which I have discussed. They can again the same thing with the uh, uh, with the component wise details. So this is the cross section of the view of the same. So this is all three are the same. Only the different way of presenting uh, things. I, I, as I told you that vacuum system is very important. Uh, otherwise, it is not. So you see that in TEM, uh, here is the TEM slot, but all other accessories are the vacuum system. So you can apply many uh, vacuum, different type of vacuum system. The most important is the diffusion and rotary pumps, which makes them uh, vacuum, and then iron get, getter pump. So finally, you will end up using all these three type of pumps to make this uh, vacuum chamber of this transmission electron microscopy of the order of 10 power minus 8 to 10 power minus 9 to see the image or to, to do this. As I discussed, there is a gun. You need an electron beam and how you can do it? You have to have a gun. So there is a three different type of gun which uh, generates um, uh, electron beam. So uh, here I'm discussing tungsten, LAB6, and field emission gun, and you see, I've taken a comparison uh, comparison table of tungsten LAB6 and field emission gun. And if you compare, I want to focus only two points. The first point is the current. Uh, you can see that brightness. The second point, the bright brightness is in tungsten. If it is one, then the field emission gun is two five hundred, uh, two thousand five hundred. So if it is very nice. But the common, the last point, the price. If the price is one rupee, then the FEG gun is hundred rupee, so hundred times costlier. And uh, again, the changing and all is there. So it is a. If you need a brighter light, you have to pay the cost and uh, things like that. So this is a three different kind of uh, filament uh, which people use depending on the money available, depending on the their work and all. You can choose any of them. Depending on the uh, gun, you the cost will vary a lot. Uh, this is again the, I have shown the cross section of especially electromagnetic guns, the coils, how the coils is made, and uh, this way you can able to see this um, uh, magnetic field which converts. Uh, you can focus your um, this uh, electron beam. Uh, here I want to discuss the specimen. How you can load your specimen. So this is a specimen rod. On top, you can see very small uh, uh, circular part where you put your things, which is called grid. And on grid, you put the signal. So this is the specification of the grid. Grid has a mess, lot of 300 to, uh, there is a many uh, messes. Uh, and this diameter is three millimeter of diameter with a copper, gold, and many, many uh, metals, uh, depending on non-magnetic materials. So many, many kind of TM grids are available, and this has a lot of mess. I will go show you the picture. This is the TM grid. This is especially the copper grid, and which you have a coating of polymer. This polymer, on polymer, you put your sample. So you see, this is the uh, sample a magnified view of your TM grid, on which you have a smaller black region where you have a sample, and there is a, a mess of copper which uh, holds this formwork coating. You see, if you magnify more, you can see there is a white patches. It means there is a formal is broken and the small patches where this uh, material is uh, there. And if you go uh, zoom in, zoom in again, then you will end up getting this nanoparticles, uh, very nice nanoparticles of uh, electron uh, of any material which you are want to see. So you can see the, uh, the magnification is very, very high here. You can go up to, up to, to see even the atoms and the small things. Now, Multi, there is a possibility of multi-purpose TEM. Nowadays, people want to buy multi-purpose where they can do chemistry, they can do microstructure, they can study the defects, they can also study um, atomic structures where by diffraction and all these things. So these are the details things. I'm not going to talk today in much detail, but I'm going to take the overview of from eye to microscope, how it goes and things like that. So if you take this, this is the diffraction pattern which, uh, which is a very specific, specific character of uh, electron microscope because the wavelength is so 
that it is uh, close to the interatomic distances of the material and therefore this is the possible condition for a diffraction and therefore a diffraction will take place and by this diffraction very similar like the x-ray diffraction you can calculate you can uh, know about your material so you can know about your material details your metal metallurgical in, uh, information and all this thing it is polycrystalline or it is a single crystal or it is amorphous all the other things is is can be calculated and depending on d value calculation and other things you can hkl uh, calculation and crystal crystal information you can in in position to get the crystal structure information and here is the material of this so these are the examples which i am quoting for the polycrystalline samples amorphous crystals how you will get the diffraction pattern these are the uh, information and not only that you can also get the information of the material which is there inside your uh, sample uh, tim can also work in bright field mode and dark field mode and this will give a different information dark field and bright field has their own advantage and people can work in dark field or bright field depending on the high contrast or material contrast the z number atomic number uh, you can know that if you have a combination of two materials and you want to do the tm by this contrast uh, you can know exactly that which one is what like, uh, where which area is the low z and which area is the high z and these are the bright field and dark field image which is on your screen uh, which suggest those information this, so this is the whole picture of diffraction high resolution low, uh, dark field and bright field will suggest everything which can be done using this transmission electron microscope so uh, I, uh, how you will do it i'm not going to talk, talk about it this is about how you do the um, if you go in the microscope how you put the eccentric positions and how the camera constant you should calculate so these are the things which is more deep if you are going to use in the microscope then only it is required otherwise it is not needed at this point of time if anybody is interested we can send the slide and discuss uh, later uh, so how we can really uh, correlate how we can find the orientation of the specimen how can zone zone uh, access and uh, what will the standard uh, index uh, if you have a bcc crystal or if you have uh, you know, other other bcc crystals other orientation or FCC crystal orientation. So these are all information or HCP crystal. So these are the information. This is the pattern which is given in the books, uh, standard books, from where you can really co correlate your images. If you take the diffraction pattern and if it is matching well with them, then exactly you know that it is HCP system or uh, BCC system or a, a cubic system, simple cubic system. Here I want to, so this is the part over where I, have, I want to discuss about uh, how my scope, what is that and how it works uh, from I to electron my scope. Uh, I want to just highlight one thing which we did uh, here in, um, in, in as, when I was there in Germany. So uh, as I discussed, Ute Kaija is the one which they did uh, develop a Titan electron my scope and I have opportunity to work in his group. Uh, while visiting from Max Planck, he is in Ulm University, but uh, I visited him and uh, I prepared a sample of glass. This is a very uh, accidental story. So what happened? I was preparing a graphene, and in graphene we are measuring the electrical conductive electrical properties, and we are not getting the good values. So it was very uh, disheartening to me that why uh, my graphene samples are not good. And then we send it to see that what is wrong with that, and let us check that what is the problem. Then when we send it to this group, then uh, uh, they studied it and they found it. We also saw the, through Raman that uh, there is a, some SiO2 peak, small peaks are there. So then we send it to them to image it that, uh, and they also realize by edX that there is some uh, component with silica is there. Uh, so this is the picture, this is the paper which says that direct imaging of two dimensional silica glass on graphene. This is first of its kind because never people has uh, measured uh, because of amorphous nature the silicon glass 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 is amorphous material so it is very difficult to image it so we we are developed we will we, we are able to measure this paper suggests that from our group here in germany then uh, ulm university and then us so this three group well muller uh, is there uh, david j muller from uh, uh, 
so uh, Cornell. So the, the, this, these people we, we we worked actually I never visited. We they, we sent the sample to them, and they saw. And this is the picture you see. So we very nicely they. This is the cartoon. The graphene is underneath, and the one layer of silicon dioxide SiO2 on top of that is is coated. And this this we are able to image it. It is the cartoon, but if you see this image next slide, then you can see it here. You see very nicely. This is the crystalline. Uh, the first left side is the crystalline MR uh, silica, and the right side is the MR first silica above the cartoon, and below is the picture. So this this we are able to uh, do it, and uh, this was first, and they they actually uh, they they made a um, what is that? Uh, very highlighted work, and uh, Greenish book record they came that first time we measured uh, image it the uh, the silica and uh, like that. You can see this is again a very nice picture of uh, this line, some region, some amorphous region. This is all possible because graphene is a conducting substrate. So without conducting substrate, you cannot have it. Graphene is a very, very nice conducting substrate. And there, if you have any amorphous like bacteria, viruses, and all this thing, this you can image it. So this is a open a new area of making far more conducting. We put the carbon things. But they no need. You can use the, this graphene film to measure all these uh, things. So with this, I thank you very much, and uh, I, I uh, tell uh, thanks a lot for your kind attention. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is able to listen to me, and uh, uh, there is no uh, technical glitch and things like that in between. Thank you, Professor Anjal, for very nice presentation. And uh, now. Uh, there is a uh, Dr. Sesa. Can you allow two, three minutes for question and answer? Yes. Uh, yeah, Varsa is uh, raising her hand. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead, Dr. Varsha Kare. It was indeed a very nice talk, Anchal. I'm happy to see you after a long time. Uh, my question is about your work. It was indeed a very uh, interesting work. Um, yeah. So the 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 silica, uh, the graphene on the silica. So how did you make yeah. this graphene? Was it the single uh, layer graphene? I can see from here that it's. Uh, yes, are, yeah. So you are very right. Actually, in principle, we are we are not making a uh, silicon graphene. It was accidental. Yeah. So. What will happen is that uh, we we are making graphene and uh, we are I, I was very frustrated because we are the electrical data was not coming the way it should be, so we thought that what is wrong and then uh, Raman suggested us Raman microscopy that there is a, some another peak which is coming and it is maybe silica, so um, then we send it for imaging and all this thing imaging has happened to Ulm University and then Cornell University. And they they not publish one paper. This is the paper published one which I have shown you. But they paper they publish paper in Science where they discuss uh, that uh, I am the I am the in acknowledgement. I am not the main author of that paper. But uh, there they have uh, shown that silicon is dancing on a thing. How it is movement? How crystallinity is changing on the interaction with the beam of electron? So yes, you are right. It is a single layer. Single layer is double layer actually. Because uh, double yeah, graphene is a, a planar structure, so it is single layer. But when you take talk as SiO2, it will come as a as, as a zigzag. So, uh, what, so what, what, that, what would what would be the reason that um, the amorphous silica has arranged um, uh, themselves uh, as a template? I mean, uh, no. of graphene. It's I haven't camp. seen that paper. I will definitely see now, because uh, okay. what we are working here uh, is yeah. on. Um, we are trying to develop some uh, pentagraphene kind of structure. So this okay. is your your work seems quite interesting. And uh, the the main issue with this is uh, with my system is that it's not a uh, single layer. Yeah. No. Here it is single layer and. Uh, what uh, we, we try to reproduce it and we are able to reproduce it, it now also. So if you want, we can send some sample to you. So it's not a problem. 
Okay, okay, that will be really interesting because if yeah. if you is it is on the silica, um, can you make it uh, the similar thing on any other amorphous system? What actually, is the... we are working on, actually we are working on it. Uh, unfortunately, because of not that good quality uh, TEM facility and other facility, we are we are stuck. We really don't know. So time takes a lot. So if so anybody if... who can help us in uh, imaging it and uh, doing this uh, edax and they have this uh, corner pupil has uh, a very nice uh, 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 different kind of microscope uh, contrast uh, based microscope so there actually, they are actually actually this is what i was uh, going to suggest to you that we have here yeah. cs corrected Henry. microscope and uh, yeah can you Sorry. guys uh, talk offline probably we can arrange some call yeah. by email Thank yeah, you. yeah, I yeah, think Anshul, it will be interesting to talk to you about this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely, it's a great thing uh, that we can collaborate. Yes, yes. 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 And we can come you understand our emotions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really <Yeah>. happy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, there is one question in the chat box. Okay. Please. What is that? Can you repeat? How the crystal structure data obtained in SAEED and XRD differs? Selected area electron and diffraction and XRD differs. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the in electron, there it's, it's, it's a kind of, if you go to the basics, then there is a, some hidden uh, things which is not allowed forbidden uh, situations in case of XRD, but that is not there in TEM. So those conditions are not valid. So this is the different uh, different thing in XRD and TEM. So sometimes when you are uh, some uh, uh, situations which is not forbidden for the X-ray, can you can see it in transmission electron microbe. This is one. Second thing is that the in XRD, you can see the whole picture of your sample. So if you have a polycrystalline sample, all the informations, you can get it. But in transmission electron microscope, since you are looking locally, so you can only get the information of that local region. So you cannot see the whole picture. That's the, that's the, that's the this two different uh, stories. So uh, if you do TM, the uh, story is different, a little different, and, uh, but, and uh, XRD, the story is too XRD so is more cross characterization. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so our third speaker is so Dr. Adit. Uh, before Dr. Verma, uh, I just wanted to inform attendees. Attendees, you want to raise any questions, you will put it in the QA box, not in the chat box, Q&A box. The second thing is the panelists will get the higher priority for any questions before it goes to attendees. So let's uh, panelists raise your hand and we will answer it. Then we go to the attendees. If attendees questions not answered, we'll collect all the questions and send it to the experts. Panelists will get you by email the response. Thank you. So kindly make uh, Dr. Adit Mohite as presenter. Sure. Done. Okay, welcome Dr. Aditya Mohite. Uh, uh, he has done uh, MS in solid state physics from Maharaja Sayaji Rao, uh, Sayaji Rao University of Baroda. Uh, this is, I am very happy that our two senior colleagues are there, Surjit Mukherjee and Nandal Yadav is there uh, in physics department. Uh, <clears throat> Postdoc work at Rice University with Ajayan. Uh, Anderson and all that. Uh, he is now uh, a associate professor of chemical and uh, biomolecular engineering, also material science and nano engineering, Rice University. Uh, uh, he, he, his research interest is in understanding and controlling photophysical processes occurring at the interfaces created with layered 2D materials, organic and inorganic materials for thin film 
light to energy conversion technologies such as photovoltaics, photo catalysis. Uh, he is also interested in application of correlated interface sensitive techniques such as photocurrent, time resolved PL, electro absorption, etc. His citation is more than 12,000 with H index of 47, I10 index of 96, and he has published as many as 144 papers in International Journal of Repute. So now I request Dr. Adit Mohite uh, to start his lecture. Mohite, sir. Good evening, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Verma, and thank you, uh, Professor Srinivasan, for the invitation. Hi, Anchal. It's great to see you, as always. And uh, today, what I would like to do is uh, really take you to the world of uh, this new <coughs> class of semiconductor, which is which everyone may or may not have heard of. It's, uh, it's uh, popularly known as halide perovskites or hybrid perovskites. And so what I want to do is kind of take you through this journey of how this, uh, you know, how this material really has become so popular, especially for optoelectronic devices. And while doing that, I want to share uh, what our contributions are. And so you'll see in this lecture is that I'll go through sort of uh, the way in which we followed this field and uh, what, what, what our contributions were. So before I start, I want to also acknowledge the funding support uh, for uh, for this work. It's been supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, the uh, you know, hydrogen program, Army Research uh, Office, uh, NSF uh, for for the graduate student funding, uh, also NAVAIR, uh, and finally, really gracious support from the Rice uh, V2C2 initiative uh, that have started about two years back. Okay. So um, we start. Uh, let's see if I can use the slides here. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So uh, you know, let me start with this very big picture. You know, humanity's ten big problems. Uh, you know, for the next fifty years, energy obviously takes the list. Uh, and number eight, which is diseases, which is what we are all in right now. Uh, and so. You can see that I think just over time we're going to be sort of going back and forth with all of these sort of lists here, and so. Uh, but but really, uh, out of all of these things, energy really dominates because that's something that really affects us very closely. You know, right from our day-to-day -day lives to also sort of uh, uh, the global, global uh, sort of picture. And so it is really critical that you know as we go into the 21st century, that energy is produced to sustainable. Uh, resources uh, and so uh, there's different things that you can do but i think that the answer has to be uh, you know you have to come up with new and innovative applications uh, you cannot just be doing simple things like photovoltaics and things like this and so here's a list that i think is going to be extremely relevant going into the 21st century for example if you want to work on photovoltaics then you better make sure you have, uh, have efficiencies which are greater than 30%. And so whether these are single junctions or tandems, thermal photovoltaics, uh, some examples are lightweight PVs for space applications, where again, you know, the efficiency is really measured by the weight of the solar cell. So this is, I think, going to be a big area where photovoltaics will dominate, but I think you have to look at efficiencies which are closer to 30% in order to make them competitive. Another big area which I think is going to be, uh, you know, which is still in its infancy and not that much progress has been made in terms of applications is solar fuels, basically using sunlight to make clean fuels uh, from sort of dirty feedstocks such as water or nitrogen or CO2 and, and really using, uh, you know, overcoming this idea of seasonal storage, which is a problem with batteries. Typically, batteries are used, but batteries don't do very well when you have extreme climates. If, they, if it's too warm or too cold, batteries don't work very well. And so, this is one uh, uh, this is one area that's really going to be important. Of course, you're going to also need things to power. Uh, you know, you may have heard of Internet of Things, which will require portable power. So, you're going to need means for doing that. Water is going to be a big issue. So, using solar energy for water purification or for pumping water, I think a lot of these projects are already uh, you know, in practice in India and many other countries. And so 
those are sort of this is sort of a list, it's not a comprehensive list by any means, but I think these are sort of areas that are going to be really, really important going uh, forward. Okay, so um, uh, what I would also like to do now uh, next is that because I realized that there may be a lot of students, uh, I wanted to spend at least two slides uh, trying to talk about the fundamentals of photovoltaics. And the reason I want to do that is because halide perovskites have been known for, you know, it's really become a popular material because the photovoltaic efficiencies have gone from about 3% in 2009 to about 25% today. And so before we kind of talk about photovoltaics and, and uh, from that perspective, I want to just share what my definition of photovoltaic is and talk a little bit about the thermodynamics of how we think about photovoltaics, because I think a lot of these, uh, while it's a simple device, but a lot of these fundamentals are not well appreciated. Okay, so if you think about a photovoltaic device, it's in my definition is at least that it, it's a, any semiconductor that absorbs lights and uses selective contacts. Okay, what does it mean? Which means that you know typically you may have read in your textbooks that you need a PN junction, uh, you know, a silicon PN junction, but you don't really need that if you have a material and if you have just contacts which are selective, a contact which can accept electrons, a contact that can accept positive charges or holes. Uh, then you will get a nice photovoltaic device. And so a typical curve looks like this. The blue blue curve here uh, is the dark curve. And then the red curve is when you put light on it and you can see that you basically generate a current, which is given, which is shown here by GSC, and then you generate a voltage. And a combination of the two or the product of the two is given uh, as your maximum power point, which is sort of your operating power point uh, of your device. And there is also, and, and there's, so there's these three, and there's also another additional thing, which is the fill factor. Uh, and so the fill factor is basically how uh, how perfect is this rectangle that you've drawn uh, along this uh, point here. And so uh, it's basically the ratio of what your what your maximum power that you obtain uh, by divided by the theoretical maximum power that you generate. And so now let's look at this each of this closely. If you think about the short circuit current, that's fairly straightforward to understand. You have a piece of semiconductor, you absorb light, it generates electrons and holes, and then uh, what you do is you basically have an electric field in the device which separates these carriers and you collect them before they recombine or before they are lost you know, to the lattice or through you know, other, uh, other processes. Okay, So that's fairly straightforward and even in the most amorphous systems like organic photovoltaics, people are able to observe or uh, uh, able to get devices which have about an external quantum quantum efficiency of 80 percent or more than that and so that's not so much of a problem uh, what's really sort of unappreciated or uh, less appreciated in in or less understood is this idea of open circuit voltage now the open circuit voltage and i'll just talk about that is completely thermodynamically determined okay uh, and also the fill factor which is also thermodynamically determined it's not a circuit property as many uh, you know oftentimes people think about so let's spend uh, uh, you know another minute just sort of thinking about it so open circuit voltage if you think about it is the same as the quasi fermi level separation or chemical potential or free energy however you want to think about it from whatever field you are but it's basically just the energy that is available to you so if you think about it, if you have foot, you know, you have this total energy, which is which I call the photon free energy. That's the photon flux that's incident on your sample. Okay? And that's given by the second law of thermodynamics, which all of you may have known. It's H mu minus T delta S. And so if you if you H mu in this case is the total energy that's available to you. And what's that? That's typically the band gap of your material, right? That's the amount of energy that's available to you. That's the maximum voltage that you can obtained from your uh, photovoltaic device. And then on the other term, the entropic term, if you remember your, you know, your uh, freshman chemistry, you'll see that your entropy can be written as different possible arrangements or combine or, uh, uh, you know, different entropies, which is given by this KT ln W, right? The different possible entropies that are possible. And so you can take this equation, sort of rearrange it in terms of you know, the operating point, what's the operating point voltage that you will get out of a device. You will see that you get an equation which looks like this. You have the band gap here, which is EG, which is the total energy available to you. But then you have all these different factors, which are entropies that you have to account for, okay? So let's think about what these different factors are. 
The first one is uh, something which is, uh, you know, which is, you know, I, I like to call it God's, you know, this is something that this is, uh, you have to give it away to God, you know, back again into the system. It's called entropy due to loss of directivity information. What does that mean? Which means that if you if you make a photovoltaic device and if you take it outside, you know, in the sun to measure it, the, the device thinks that the sunlight is coming from all around itself, right? It's coming it's coming from all parts of the sky. But that's not that's not quite true because if you think about the sun, it subtends a very specific angle with respect to your device. Okay, this is this omega s, which is your solid angle subtended by the sun. So if you think about the sun rising and going all the way, uh, you know. And, you can get all the different possible angles it subtends in the day. In the morning, it's in the east, and in, in the afternoon, it's in, in, in uh, uh, you know, it's right on the top of the uh, device. And then, as uh, you know, evening falls, it goes to the west. If you count all those specific angles, you'll find that there are about forty thousand different angles that can be subtended. And so, if you have to account, that's in a way you can think about this as entropy of photons, right? Because, in, a, in fact, astrophysicists know this very, very well. And so this is the entropy that you have to account for. The sun's not really everywhere, but it's got some entropy, uh, uh, which is a function of some direction, directionality. And so if you do that, you'll get a factor which is about 0.28 electron volts or about 0.3 electron volts, which you just have to subtract from your, uh, your device. Yeah. And so this is the first law. So no matter what photovoltaic device you're making, the first loss, you, you know, whatever band gap you have, you just subtract 0.3 electron volts away and you just give it away. And that's why I call this the gift of God. You can't really do anything about it unless you're using a concentrator or some other special, special weights. Another loss that can be really uh, big is entropy due to incomplete light trapping. So imagine you make a device and it doesn't trap light completely, then you can actually get losses associated with that. And so the minimum loss you can get is about 0.1 electron volts. And so you lose about again 100 millivolts like that. Okay. Third loss is something which is called free energy loss due to power point optimization. Okay. Let's see what that means. Okay. So if I go back a slide, if you think about this curve, right? If you think about the JSC and the VOC. Now, what statistical physics and statistical mechanics tells us is that if you want to get a maximum voltage and a maximum current, you cannot really get maximum of both, right? You cannot get best of both worlds. You have to compromise. There's so much like life, right? You have to compromise. And so this compromise is made at this power, maximum power. Okay? So the uh, voltage says, I'm going to lose some, some of my, you know, I'm going to give up some of the voltage in order to come to this point. And the current says, I'm going to get, lose some of the current in order to get to this point. And so you'll see that this loss that is there, right? The amount of voltage that you lose in order to get to the maximum power point is what this loss is basically it's called uh, and, and so you can see that this loss can be quite large and so if your fill factor is really bad uh, then you can get a substantial loss and oftentimes people think of this as a circuit property but it's in, indeed actually thermodynamically determined okay so that's sort of a big one then you also have another loss which often is counterintuitive to think about this is loss due to poor quantum efficiency so what does that mean that means that if you have a device okay and if you are operating this device at open circuit, by open circuit, which means we, we mean that there is no electric field that is present inside your device. This means that it's just like a piece of semiconductor that is sort of lying there. And so if you have sunlight coming in, light is absorbed, it's going to create electron hole pairs, and it's going to again recombine and give out photons, right? It's going to give out uh, you know photoluminescence, and that's the quantum efficiency of the device. And this is the this is the uh, a photoluminescence quantum efficiency. And so if that's not, if your device is not doing that efficiently, then you may also get a loss. And so you can see that there's so, and there's of course some other losses which are sort of minor and which is from corrections of constants and things like this. You can see that there are these multiple type of entropies that one has to really sort of account for in order to make that. And so uh, that's really critical. And so really what I want to say is that the voltage in a photovoltaic device is way more critical than obtaining sort of a short circuit current. Okay. All right. So, and so if you think about what has happened, you know, in, in photovoltaic technologies over, over five decades, this is sort of the chart that you'll be referred to often. This is basically plotting efficiency as a function of uh, uh, the years over uh, five, you know, five decades and it encapsulates all the possible photovoltaic technologies that are present. 
Uh, and so you'll see on the top this uh, silicon and gallium arsenide, which are the most dominant sort of photovoltaic technologies that you'll see. The highest is gallium arsenide with about 30% efficiencies. I'm talking about single junction cells. Silicon is about 25%. Okay, and, and then, of course, there are these emerging technologies, which were also called as generation three solar cells, because these are solution process. And so the two more uh, popular ones, which you may have heard of, is this disensitized uh, solar cell or Gratzel cell, which is known after, uh, you know, Michael Gratzel. Uh, and uh, the second one is organic photovoltaics, where you have polymer and you sort of make, uh, you know, a mixture of along with the conduct another conducting polymer or another conducting material. And so you've seen that over several decades, this, these efficiencies have really sort of been limited to about 10 to 12 percent. And now, of course, they are rising. But it's interesting. It was interesting to me to see that when these, you know, just where these technologies kind of meet, that's around the time where this perovskite technologies really started to take off, right? Perovskite based systems. And so you'll see this red curve and see perovskite so sort of, you know, there was a combination of, I guess, I believe, knowledge of coming from both of these. Sort of technologies and so the perovskites kind of took off and now we are you know we have a situation where we are like this this is almost outdated now so the record efficiency is about 25 percent okay uh, and you'll see i'm comparing this to all the well-known semiconductors that are known to us okay and if you see this plot you'll see that the perovskites really have an exponential growth in terms of efficiency and this is quite a, quite unprecedented so this has never really happened in the history of semiconductors. Things have kind of gone slowly. Uh, and, and so that's the reason why halide perovskites became really, really popular and now are recognized as a new class of semiconductors. Okay. And so uh, the obvious question is that this is, of course, uh, um, you know, people have got very interested in trying to understand uh, why this is uh, sort of the case. But before we get into this, let's, let's quickly uh, uh, think about what a perovskite is. Perovskite is just any, any material that has a chemical uh, formula of AMX3 or ABO3. And I'm sure that you sort of worked on perovskites before. You know, uh, for example, a, simple, uh, a common example would be calcium titanate uh, or strontium titanate or lead titanate. You know, these are sort of uh, the common perovskites that have been available to us right from, you know, I think sometime in the 18th century. And so uh, what people did, uh, you know, over the years is that they replaced this A cation, A site here by an organic cation, uh, something like a methyl ammonium or also a combination of, uh, you know, cesium or formamidinium. These are sort of organic or can be, of course, inorganic like cesium as well. They replaced this metal M here, which was, type, say, for example, titania here with a divalent metal like lead, lead 2 plus or 10. So basically it a two plus valency metal. And then the X here was the halide, which was basically iodine, chlorine, chlorine. And so if you actually replace this with any of these compounds or combinations of this, and you work out something which is known as the Goldschmidt's tolerance factor, which is given by this formula here, which is just a ratio of some ionic radii, you will get, if you get a value between 0 0.8 and 0 0.1, and one, which means that you made a perovskite material, okay? And so that's what it is. And so, uh, you know, these perovskites, especially in their hybrid forms, so oftentimes they're also known as halide, organic, inorganic, or hybrid perovskites. And so, um, you know, for example, and also another property of these perovskites is that it has a very soft lattice. It's a soft semiconductor. It's a soft material. For, and so the Young's modulus of this material is about 10 times smaller than other semiconductors like silicon and gallium arsenic, right? Conventional semiconductors that you know of. Another very interesting thing about these perovskites is that you can also have uh, two dimension versions of this, uh, you know, which are known as these layered 2D perovskites. And here are two sort of examples of this. So here's a 2D halide perovskite, uh, and it has a structure which is well known, which is known as this Rudelson Popper phase. And I'll talk about that a uh, little, bit, little bit later. But what you have briefly is basically you have this perovskite, this octahedra, which I was talking to you about. And they are separated by organic cations, right? In this case, the organic cations are quite bulky. And so you'll see you have a layer of the of the of the of the perovskite octahedra, and you have an organic cation, perovskite octahedra, organic cation. You can actually very controllably tune the thickness of this layer. So here you see you have an uh, you know which we which we refer refer to as n value. And so you can see here there are two slabs of the organic uh, or the or the perovskite octahedra. And then here's there's three slabs, which is N3. 
four slabs, and of course, the infinity case is the three dimension. And you can have motifs of this, which are, you know, like, for example, Dion Jacobson is another structural phase that's available. And the, and the beauty of the Perovskites is that each of these sites can be chemically tailored and engineered. And so that gives it tremendous amount of flexibility and, uh, you know, there's a lot of rich science that you could do in terms of understanding, you know, the structure and property uh, of these materials, and especially of soft semiconductors. This is the first evidence of a semiconductor that has, uh, you know, both an organic and inorganic and such close sort of, uh, you know, which are so intimately connected, and they are actually single crystals, okay? So that's sort of uh, an interesting thing about it. So now let's sort of look at what really makes these halide perovskites so special. Okay? So the first thing is that these are low temperature processed or in fact solution processed semiconductor. You can take, you know, you can do dirty chemistry. You can take any of these, uh, you know, precursors, mix them in a solvent, and get single crystals which are very very large. You can see this is this is an image given to me by a close friend and collaborator, Professor Mercury Canadzides at Northwestern. And you can see you can make these really centimeter scale single crystals. And so this was really our first entry into the field of perovskites. We kind of, this field kind of, you know, it was rejuvenated in, the, in 2011 uh, when Henry Snaith came up with his uh, seminal papers on showing 12% efficiencies with these cells. And so we really got into this game, you know, only two years late. Uh, and so we, uh, the way we started doing this is we're trying to sort of make some of these, you know, some, some thin films made, made out of perovskite. And we developed a new method, which we call the hot casting method. And the idea here is that you have a substrate that is hot, okay? Uh, and you take a precursor mixture with the right sort of molar stoichiometries, and you spin and you put it down here and start spin coating the substrate. As the substrate is spinning, it's also cooling down. So the substrate is hot. That's why the name hot casting. And then when you end, uh, end what you get is something that looks like this. So here in the below, I'm showing you, uh, you know, optical images. The first one is, of course, electron microscopy. You can see as cast film has, you know, grains which are really small. But as you sort of increase your casting or your, or your substrate temperature, you, we saw that there was a formation of these grains which continued to grow larger and larger. And so we were able to get these grains which were of the order of about millimeter in size. Not only that, if you actually look at the cross section of these, uh, these uh, grains, you'll see that these look like, you know, these look like bulk semiconductors. They, you don't see any grains and things like this. And, and so in fact, you can take an X-ray diffraction spectra, which is what Anchel kind of talked about very briefly. It's basically the same as taking a diffraction, looking at the atomic spacing. And if you compare that to a single crystal, you can actually find peaks that match very well with what you see in the single crystal. So which is, I think, at least to me, this was remarkable that this is the first time you had a solution process material and you could just simply spin coat it and you could get a material that had these sharp diffraction peaks, which are observed in single crystals. And so that I thought was sort of amazing. And so we did a lot of work and sort of understanding this process. We were obviously very, you know, as soon as I saw this, I was very excited, especially if you've seen silicon panels, you'll see these different combinations of blues. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this basically implies that there are these grains. And so the one thing you know from a device physics is that you, if you can optimize these grains, make them larger, get to more of a monocrystal in regime, then you will get efficient devices. So we just did that. What we did was we took these types of films and we made these simple sort of two, you know, devices where you had, you know, this uh, your FTO glass, which is conducting transparent oxide, uh, P dot PS, which is a hole transport. It's a selective contact which likes to collect holes, the positive charge. You put down perovskites, and you have PCBM or C60, which is uh, a selective contact which likes electrons, and then you just put some sort of an electrode like aluminum on top. So what we were able to show is, uh, you know, we were able to get very reproducible performance. So here I'm plotting the current density as a function of applied voltage. And one of the issues with the perovskite community was that there was a lot of strong hysteresis before this time. And so here we were able to show that you don't see any hysteresis uh, in these devices. You can do that as a function of scan rate and you'll see that this hysteresis is very, very negligible. We were able to get a nice quantum efficiency. You'll see that the quantum efficiency as a function of excitation wavelength is more than 80% or 90% uh, at all times. And you can integrate this to get your short circuit current, which is about 20 milliamps per centimeter square. 
And of course, you can you can plot then your power conversion efficiency on the left as a function of grain size. You know, as the grain size, as I, as I said, there's you know as your casting temperature or your substrate temperature is increasing, your grain size is increasing. So you have this beautiful correlation where as your grain size increases, you see this very very uh, you know nicely correlated increase in your current density, which is plotted in your right, and also your power conversion. Okay. Most importantly, that there were also a lot of issues of reproducibility, and so what we showed is that these were very reproducible. These devices, we were able to get an average efficiency of about 15%. This is about 50 measured devices, and the peak efficiency that we were able to report was about 18% during that time. It was sort of a record at that time. Um, but but uh, you know uh, what's really important when you're doing these type of measurements is statistics, and so really this 18%, if you see on this plot, is just an outlier. And so, uh, you know, this is not really a great number to report. And so what, what we reported was basically an average efficiency of 15.5%. Okay. Anyway, so uh, this was great. Uh, and so also in addition to these, you know, there were a lot of other sort of properties which are really ideal for making any type of minority carrier device or optoelectronic device. So let's kind of walk through these. First, this is a direct band gap semiconductor, which means that you know you have these very nice conditions where your light uh, falls in. You can make a very thin uh, layer of this material and absorb all the light. Compared to say silicon, where you need at least order of magnitude more material, it has a very large absorption coefficient. The absorption coefficient is uh, uh, is uh, you know greater than ten to the five, which is comparable to that of gallium arsenide. It has a tunable band gap. You know, of course, if you if you made a semiconductor, it's always great to be able to tune the energy uh, of their band gap. And so you can tune this all the way from the blue to actually the near infrared. Also, it has small effective masses. Uh, what does that mean? Which means that if your mass of your electrons and holes is, is small, which means that they can move about very easily. And so your mobility is typically high. And so you can transport them very well. And so typically, if you're making a device, you want this uh, to be quite low. Also, it has, uh, you know, it creates free carriers at room temperature. What does that mean? Which means that if you put light on this material, these electrons and holes, they're not Coulombically bound, right? If you, they are, of course, opposite carriers. And so they, uh, the binding energy in this is very small. It's about 10 milli electron volts at room temperature, which means that as soon as you form this electrons and holes, they are not sort of talking to each other. They are not sort of bound tightly. You can easily dissociate them. And finally, another very unique and novel property of this perovskite is defect tolerance. Okay, what does that mean? Which means that you know there are of course defects like any other material. There are grain boundaries. There's different sort of effects like this, but these defects don't seem to uh, cause that much harm. You know, these defects seem to be very close to your band edges, like conduction band and the valence band. And so you can get uh, photoluminescence lifetimes, which are very, very long of the order of 200 nanoseconds, or even people have reported all, all the way up to about a micron, microsecond long lifetimes. And so this means that these carriers, you know, the electron or the hole, they move around, they are, they are present in this material for a long time and they don't really get lost. Okay. And so that's a really sort of a unique property because most of the time when you have defects, you lose these carriers very, very fast. And so that's sort of what makes it special. But what's really special is that all of these properties exist in a single material. So if you ask any person who's doing semiconductors, and if you give them one of these properties, he'll take it very happily. But this is sort of the, the, the mystery and the magic of the halide perovskites, where, you know, because of it, the way it has been made, or, you know, uh, that these properties are all in one material. Okay. All right, and so as a result, you know, people have found many, many applications. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we've of course this is something we've, we've been working on. You know, we have flexible solar cells. You have solar fuels that we're working on. You can get color tunable LEDs. You can also make electron sources for night imaging or just electron sources for different kind of uh, applications. You can get memory devices. You can get gamma ray or you know radiation detectors. This is actually a break, some real breakthrough that uh, uh, my colleague, uh, you know, my uh, collaborator, Nadzities, has done, where he's able to look at gamma ray, uh, you know, detection at room temperature, you know, transistors. And so you, you'll see that, you know, you're really, we are treating this as a semiconductor and really trying to understand different sort of where, uh, you know, where we can apply this material and this, understand its properties and, and sort of come up with some sort of applications. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and, and so as we were sort of doing this work, you know, one of the things that, you know, so the, so the most prototypical material of this, say, a 3D perovskite 
would be uh, methyl ammonium lead triiodide, okay, CH3NH3, which is the salt, lead is the metal here, and I, I, uh, I3 is your uh, halide. And so what we found very earlier on, I won't go into too many details, is that this material was not very stable under light. Okay, and so the experiment that we did was so forth. So you have a, G, you have a solar cell that was made, and we measured the photovoltaic device at point A, which is the open circuit voltage, and we measured the photovoltaic device at point B. And what we found is that when you, uh, when you look at the open circuit voltage as a function of time and this time, basically you turn the solar simulator on, and you let it go and you measure the same way you measure this short circuit current at point b and in what we found is that the voltage is fine it you know it, it it increases in the beginning but then remains quite flat it does not really degrade if you turn your lights off uh, you know if you turn your solar simulator off and come back again but your short circuit current does something very interesting it increases but then over time it kept decreasing like this Okay, and so if you turn your lights off again, you you found that your short circuit current sort of self healed. It went back to its original value, and then it continued doing the same thing. And so uh, we explain this by the presence of the formation of light induced st uh, trap states within the band gap of this material. And nevertheless, you know I won't go into details of this. And so if you see the power conversion efficiency, you basically get a curve which looks like this. You know you have a device which kind of keeps degrading like this. Uh, and so if you turn your lights off, it goes back again to its original value, keeps degrading. Basically, it reflects what happens in your short circuit current. And so we wanted to kind of come up with a device that was more stable. And so, of course, we've come, come up with a lot of combinations of 3D perovskites now, which are stable. And we have some very nice published work. But today, what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit more about these 2D perovskites. Now, these two different okay. Yes. Um, can you take another two, three minutes to wrap up? Thank you. Okay. And so uh, these two dimensional perovskites are basically, uh, you know, you'll see these structures that, uh, that, we, uh, that we made. And as I mentioned, that these are basically, uh, uh, you know, solution process uh, uh, materials as well. And so you have these, uh, uh, you know, materials where you have these structures which you can tune very nicely. And they've been known because they were very, very stable. And so you can actually look at sort of the absorption spectrum. This is a function of N value, the perovskite layer thickness. And you can see that you can tune the energy very well. You can tune the photoluminescence and uh, emission quite well. And so we took these materials because they were, you know, way more stable than this three-dimensional structure. And uh, we made photovoltaic devices. Now, of course, previously people had made these devices. In fact, the first evidence of putting any kind of current into this device was done in the 90s uh, by David Midzi and co-workers, where they showed that you can make good FETs out of this. Of course, people had more recently tried to make photovoltaic devices, but these efficiencies were quite low, about 4%. And so uh, we wanted to sort of see what was the issue with this. And so we kind of realized this quite, uh, uh, quite fast, that if you actually look at a device, right, if you look at these two-dimensional perovskites, they like to sort of align like this. If you spin coat a film, you have a perovskite slab, and then you have this big organic cation, which is right in the middle. Okay? And so if you're trying to pass a current or measure a device like this, you'll see that this uh, charge is obviously scattered, which is across this insulating barrier, which is this organic cation. And so it would be perfect if you could actually align this uh, in a 90 degree orientation. So you flip this over and, and you align it in such a way that your electrons that uh, do not sort of scatter away. And so uh, what we set out to do was that can we really achieve this uh, process? And so we applied this hot casting technique in order to apply that uh, to try this. And so here's a here's an X-ray diffraction, two-dimensional X-ray diffraction spectrum, where you're seeing this is at room temperature. But as you sort of increase your your substrate temperature, what you're able to see is that this spectra turns into spots. Okay. If you keep doing this, it starts into you know you start seeing these very nice sort of uh, you know spots. But if you go too high in temperature, of course, then you lose crystallinity again. And so whenever you see these spots in your diffraction spectrum, just like Anshan was saying, so showing some of these diffraction patterns, uh, you, you know that you are looking at a near single crystalline material or you're something which is very well oriented. And so what we did was we did the hard work of sort can of- we, Can we close this? Because uh, we are running out of time. Okay, all right. Uh, let me just go to one more slide and I will-, I will okay. Okay, and so, you know, we were able to sort of get this and we were able to make this, uh, uh, you know, very nice, efficient devices. 
uh, which had about 12% efficiency at that time. We've, of course, improved this to about 17%. But the most important thing, and I'll close with this slide, is that in comparison to our 3D perovskites, the 2D perovskites were extremely stable. Okay, and so here's a, uh, here's a slide which is showing you these are devices under continuous light and over 2,000 hours of stability. And so you see, comp in compared to the 3D perovskite, these are way more stable. This is a device which is about with about 65% relative humidity. And so this has really sort of triggered a big sort of a, a field in itself where people are now really working on this material and, uh, and trying to use this into different type of applications, exploring the physics of this. Okay, great. So with that, I will just end here uh, uh, and, and I'll go to um, just the acknowledgement here. I want to just thank my group uh, uh, and all the collaborators who've uh, you know, supported with this work and happy to take some questions. In this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohite, for a very nice presentation. Yeah. We have uh, one, one question we can take just for a moment. What are the advantages and disadvantages of small effective mass in semiconductor materials? Yeah, so, yeah. so the effective mass, if you, uh, if you go and look at your band structure, which you may have seen, right? If you have this sort of a, a band structure, uh, uh, depending on how uh, that mass is basically inversely proportional to that band structure, right? It's, uh, and so if you have something which is very, very light, if you have a very, very sharp, for example, if you think of graphene, right? If it has a very, very sharp sort of Dirac-like band structure, you can see that these electrons which are present on, in, in, if you excite an electron there, they can move very rapidly there. If it's a light carrier, you can move this carrier very rapidly along the these bands. But if you have something which is an insulator, then you have a very flat dispersion. And so it, it takes a lot of effort to move these carriers. And so your mobility is much, much lower. So it's just like thinking about uh, you know classical mechanics. If you have a heavy ball and if you have a light ball, obviously in the light ball, you can throw this much further along as opposed to a big sort of a heavy ball. You can propel this along. And so that's how you think about this. OK, thank you. Dr. Uh, now, our last speaker is Professor Binay Kumar. He is professor in the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi. He has done PhD with Professor G. Uh, G. G. Gunayat, sir, great crystallographer. Uh, he has developed uh, uh, technologically important crystals, nanostructure, ceramics, uh, and also used them for fabricating piezoelectric and communication devices. He has published over 160 research papers in international journals, guided 18 students for PhD degree, delivered 60 talks in various conferences and served as reviewer of many international journals published by Nature, Elsewhere, RSC, ETC. He has also completed seven major research projects. He was chairperson of DU College, external expert of SAP program and coordinator NAC expert team. His citation is over 3000 with H index of 32, I10 index of 89. He is going to uh, deliver a talk on piezoelectric crystals and nanoparticles for flexible nano generators. So now I request uh, Professor Binay Kumar to start his talk. Uh, thank Professor you. Uh, should I put the chair? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your nice uh, introduction and I was actually enjoying very much all the lectures. So uh, I start with uh, uh, thanking Professor uh, Kiran Barma and Shesha. And today I was really excited to know that uh, your university is starting a new department, materials and nanotechnology, particularly I'm a hardcore uh, experimentalist in this area. I'm very happy to hear about it. So in this uh, talk, I will just uh, give a few uh, words about my recent work done in crystal and nanoparticles. Uh, 
some basics of nanoparticles, which I have reduced because the time is less now. And then uh, piezoelectricity in crystals of various kind which we have grown. And then, uh, of course, the fabrication of uh, our nanogenerators. Uh, the references which we have, I, I have shown in uh, different slides, all, each and every reference pertains to our own work. So that's why I have not given the name of the author, only the reference in a general name. So to introduce my lab, um, uh, we are uh, growing so many uh, type of material, ferroelectric, semiconductor, multi uh, so the high TC superconductors, and of course, in the form of crystal ceramic and nanoparticles. We have so many growth techniques in our lab, and it's uh, particularly piezoelectric and ferroelectric characterization. Uh, apart from this, we have uh, all facilities for experimental uh, characterization as well. So just to share some of the photographs of some crystals, which uh, we finally I will be showing that we have used these crystals for making nanopart uh, for uh, nano generators, etc. So these are organic crystals. I'm not going to name them. Just to enjoy the color and beauty of these crystals. That's all. Uh, most of them are solution grown crystals uh, and uh, organic or semi-organic crystals. Uh, this is another category which we may be using here. Uh, this is a uh, high density uh, P Z and P T crystals. This is uh, lead free and uh, M K L N crystals. This is one photograph of high density superconductor dispers two two one two, and this is not topic of my work in today's lecture. And this is again uh, M N doped uh, P N K T crystals. They all have been published earlier in last few years. And one uh, one slide is just to show. The lead free piezoelectric crystals, NPLN, BNKT, and some others. They are extremely good uh, because they are showing the piezoelectric properties uh, better than PZT and lead free as well. Now, these are the few photographs uh, of organic uh, crystals, uh, of side crystals, and halide crystals, which we show from uh, Chakrovsky, which we have developed uh, in our lab. To uh, this, and nowadays the definition does not require an elaboration because everybody now uh, knows that nanoparticles with one dimension of the particles should be uh, now it is even less than 100 nanometer. Uh, to show that how nanoparticles are actually in use because of uh, how their properties are getting changed because of quantum effects come into effect. As uh, because uh, discussing nanoparticles is not my uh, aim today. I am just want to show some uh, nanoparticles grown and how they are used for uh, piezoelectric applications. So, uh, but few things that uh, nanomaterials are important. They are uh, more reactive. They are uh, most of the properties related to nanoparticles size is because of uh, the very large surface to volume ratio, and because the quantum effect is start to dominate at the nano scale. Uh, just to have one slide uh, to show that if I have one uh, a cube of one meter height, our volume is six meter square. But if we reduce the size, that is cutting, cutting, and cutting, then finally uh, with nano size particles of the same volume, it is going uh, six one thousand more. Uh, more than uh, 6,000 kilometer square. So, uh, just to uh, have some idea that why the surface area increases when we go on a smaller side. And slide is uh, just to sum up that uh, when we are dealing with nanoparticles, how many nanoparticles, uh, the, the only wavelength which is associated with the particles becomes uh, smaller or uh, smaller or of the same range of the particle itself. And then all these changes come into picture. And again, that we have three or four uh, types of nanoparticle, one dimensional, two dimensional, and how the density of states are changing uh, from this uh, continuous to finally a discrete one. The energy harvesting uh, application. What we mean by uh, energy harvesting? 
that we have to generate energy, electrical energy particularly, uh, without spending any energy from our side. We will be using uh, the energy available in the, uh, in the nature, either it is walking or light or wind or movement of vehicles, etc. Even uh, the movement of my hand and muscles uh, will also uh, can be used to give uh, energy. If we are able to do it, uh, this is energy harvesting. And if we, because the other sources of energy are depleting in time, uh, there is a, uh, other problems like pollution, etc. So if we use a very small fraction of available energy, uh, we can make so many uh, portable uh, devices uh, like uh, watches, mobile, uh, run without uh, uh, taking into consideration the expenditure of any other type of when we uh, think of nano generator uh, energy generation, uh, two or three types of uh, nano generators are in picture. One is piezoelectric nano generators. Uh, I will explain this what is piezoelectricity and all. Then one is triboelectric and pyroelectric, in which these two are related with the mechanical energy input, and this is thermal energy. We must thank uh, and remember a few people who who started the work Wang and at in 2006, first Jadano nanowire based piezoelectric. And uh, so many other workers started uh, doing that. This piezoelectric based nano generator, if we can make it, so what are the things which is possible? Uh, for example, you can see that there are a lot many people are walking across a road, say on, across a red light on a railway station gate. If we can use the energy, which is uh, mechanical energy, which is because of the heel of a stroke, uh, then uh, we can use this energy, which will be generated for so many other purposes. So uh, ultimately, we must start thinking of energy harvesting in a realistic way, uh, because uh, this is the future. Uh, particularly, which is piezoelectric uh, uh, generators are. Uh, safe, uh, it is green energy, uh, we are not in a uh, requirement of spending any uh, anything from the nature, we are just using the things which are otherwise going waste. To define what is piezoelectricity, uh, this is a level or MSC level of things, that piezoelectric material are those material in which if we apply a pressure, we get a electricity. If we, conversely, if we give some uh, electrical energy, if we will apply AC voltage, we get a mechanical disturbance which can be converted into a vibration and this can be used for some other thing. Uh, for example, in this case, we can get a uh, energy generation and in this case, we are getting a vibration. Uh, if it is a piezoelectric material, uh, what are the things we actually look for? We look for uh, one particular uh, property that is piezoelectric charge coefficient. We normally call it PE3, which is either uh, Pico Coulomb per Newton. Uh, it is the charge developed on the application of a particular force. And this also uh, expressed in another term that the displacement, that is Pico meter per unit volt applied. When we think of a real uh, devices, we uh, have some other parameters uh, which should be uh, conducive for doing the device. For a few examples of piezoelectricity in a common uh, everyday life, uh, we all know about quartz watches. Uh, we put some electrical energy, there is a quartz crystal and it starts vibrating and that vibration, that is the corresponding frequency is converted into time and we have a quartz watch. This is a simple lighter we use uh, to light the gas stove. And just apply pressure, there is a uh, impulse uh, created at this point where there is a piezoelectric material and this piezoelectric material develops some charge which is this is going out and gives you light. Uh, this is a photo uh, of uh, one uh, cantilever of AFM that when this continues, this tip moves on a rough surface, it goes up and down, and this cantilever, because there, there is a vibration on the other side, 
this mechanical force uh, put uh, on a piezoelectric uh, material here, and that piezoelectric material gives you uh, electrical signal, which is corresponding to the uh, motion of the tip. And this, in this way, we actually we are able to convert this movement of uh, uh, FM tip into the electrical signal and the surface power. I have taken from internet just to show uh, so many different type of application of piezoelectric uh, nano generator, which is a tape type here. Different materials which we are using for making this piezoelectric device. Uh, just to give you one comparison that I have explained what is G33, that is how much electricity we can generate with a particular force, one Newton force with how much uh, charge can be developed. So quartz is the most common name, but it has very small value, one to two. Lithium nitride is 20. Geneno, uh, when it is pure, uh, it is uh, one to 10. Uh, of course, we have achieved up to 300 to 400 with various type of doping. PJT is a material which is uh, uh, very much in use by industry and uh, so many other, other technology electrification, but it has a value of 400, nearly 400 for uh, PJT. And uh, there are some uh, lead free and lead based materials. These are the materials which we are growing in our lab. Uh, it is uh, PJ and PT crystals, which is about, we have achieved about 2000, above 2000, uh, close to 2000 for PM and PT crystals. Uh, PJ we have also grown up to 450. Then there are lead free materials uh, because uh, in many applications, particularly in household application, we try to avoid this uh, lead part. So for lead free materials, we have achieved up to 500 to 800 uh, uh, D3. So you can compare that uh, with respect to quartz and PJT, the materials which are uh, we are using are much more, much better uh, D3 values. So what does it mean that if you use a material which has a higher values of uh, piezoelectric constants, you, your efficiency and uh, working range, etc will be much better in uh, when we uh, use a particular device made up of these materials. One slide to show uh, how the video electricity and electricity is uh, coming out of a crystal. So you see there are a uh, material, this is Jadeno, and it is uh, uh, oocytes. We have vergite uh, structures. Then uh, the basic thing is that uh, the center of all the positive charges and the center of all the negative charges, uh, there is a mismatching. And this mismatching is uh, uh, giving rise to a uh, polarization. And if we apply force, uh, we, this uh, mismatching is either increased or decreased, giving a uh, change in the polarization. And this change in polarization is actually converted into development of voltage across the surface of the you know, particles of crystal. Uh, I have given this explanation here. Uh, again, uh, one is a uh, uh, in perovskite uh, structure. Uh, in this perovskite structure, again, there are these oxygen layers, oxygen layers, and this center, uh, when we apply a force, you can find out the center of positive and negative charges are getting displaced uh, upward or downward, giving rise to uh, a polarization vector. Uh, one slide is here just to show that in one particular case, uh, in PM and PT crystals, uh, we have developed uh, uh, very high, almost close to 2,000. Piezoelectric charge coefficient, and in some group, it's even more than that. Uh, so, uh, as compared to some other materials which has piezoelectric uh, coefficient less, uh, we are getting much better performance when we make a device out of these crystals. Uh, there are few materials which we are using uh, in our lab. We are growing the crystals and ceramics of. Uh, Many good materials. They are, they are really called uh, futuristic piezoelectric uh, materials because it has uh, extremely high piezoelectric uh, properties. 
of course we have used uh, these materials jadano uh, jadano nanoparticles and then many uh, semi organic crystals which are uh, piezoelectric in nature and we will be uh, i will be showing that how they are used for making devices uh, we have uh, normally do so many characterization uh, structural characterization surface characterization uh, then the electrical characterization optical characterization micro hardness etc etc but uh, in this presentation i am not showing any result i am just showing ferroelectric and pyroelectric and piezoelectric uh, properties of these materials uh, one slide to show you that if we make it i will again come back to this uh, how we make these devices uh, but here that if, if this device is made up of uh, nkln and pdms uh, thick film so uh, just to show that if Uh, there is no force we are voltage output is zero uh, when we are pressing it we are getting a voltage output i will show the values it is maybe 10 volt to 50 volts depending upon different materials and when we release this pressure even then we are getting a uh, voltage output now just to explain a uh, small thing uh, if i have a rod of the nano rod so how uh, uh, a electrode can uh, give up a voltage uh, and how we can apply force one is very simple that we have a device and we can put a pressure from outside there is another way that if i have a rod like this and if i tilt it like this then what is happening actually this side is compressed and the outer side is uh, extended so even if this uh, the change in the dimension in this side and this side is even in picometer it it, it can uh, produce a extremely uh, high uh, tension inside uh, the the rod and this uh, the extended part and, and the uh, compressed part give a different type of voltages opposite direction voltage uh, electric field and then we can get uh, voltage out. Uh, one more uh, thing that this is the same one that how the tilting of an anode can lead to a voltage output. If we apply, this is another thing. And if if I apply a uh, force either from wind or from uh, even uh, from the ocean uh, waves which are coming and uh, uh, pressing uh, this upper surface, we can get some voltage. Then there is third thing that if I I can move these rods on a rough surface, the tip of the frame or something, you can find that uh, there are two type of thing. One is come tilted on this direction. This will give one type of voltage output. This is tilted on the other direction. In this case, it is compressed, and uh, because of this compression, we will get voltage. So there are many ways uh, this device can give you uh, output energy. Now come to the synthesis of nanoparticles. We all know that there are uh, basically two ways. One is top down. Top down means we have a bulk material. In our case, uh, we we have grown uh, single crystals of different materials. We have uh, synthesized various ceramics. In the grain size is uh, uh, about five to ten or fifteen uh, micrometer. So we take the material in a higher uh, and then grind it uh, with uh, our bauxite and then make a nanoparticles another way is uh, to synthesize from uh, atomic level uh, uh, we make a reaction out of two chemicals uh, maybe a low temperature uh, synthesis that is a, a chemical reaction and there are many other ways also to manipulate the atoms or molecules of the material to give you nanoparticles we are using both method to get our nanoparticles uh, one is uh, from uh, chemical reaction uh, this is uh, uh, one chemical which is reacting with each other with the nanoparticles and we get uh, this type of structure this is one example one dimensional nanoparticles we have uh, two dimensional dendrite rod also is uh, one uh, photograph just to show uh, the different type of jadano we have grown uh, by uh, this technique and uh, different dopings are there uh, 
and uh, different dopings lead to different uh, morphology. Some are uh, simple rod type, some are pencil type like this, uh, some are nano sheets like this. This is a flower, but uh, when we go to uh, 100 nano scale, so these sites are hardly 5 to 10 nanometer uh, width of uh, one sheet, in the sheet type of thing. And they are extremely good uh, crystalline in nature. You can see very sharp. Uh, points here, uh, which just confirm that they are uh, good in crystallinity. They are very, uh, of course, it looks like a bundle, looks like a flower, looks like this, but they are actually composed of very high quality uh, single rods of very good single crystals. Like this, we are able to take out few nano rods, single nano rods. It is very uh, rare photograph that you can take out. One out of it, this is uh, one uh, generator rod, this is another generator rod, some dope material. And uh, we have uh, about 15 20 publications in the last three years on nanoparticles of this kind. Photograph is just to show uh, the different morphology again through temp. These are there in the earlier picture also. And then average diameter of these rods uh, changing uh, goes to. Uh, 50 to 135 and so on. And just to again uh, uh, confirm that uh, these particles are not amorphous, anything like this, but they are very good single crystalline. This is another one. Uh, I'm just to. Uh, this is uh, if you can see it, uh, that how the D3 value different uh, different groupings have been reported by many other groups, and a few of these belong to our lab also, particularly this 412. Uh, this 420 belongs to our lab. This is another. Uh, uh, most of these DT3 uh, values pertains to our research. Uh, and uh, uh, we can we have uh, shown that uh, this is because of different type of morphology that we are getting high value of DT3 from 5 to 10. To state away a uh, few hundreds. In the case of Jadano. Uh, now, come to uh, another uh, picture that uh, we have used uh, single crystal of PM and PT and, uh, and KLN and so many uh, different uh, ceramics like this one and this one uh, to make nanoparticles. So, I am not showing uh, our uh, normally. Uh, it takes uh, almost uh, four to five days or maybe even more uh, for continuous blending. Um, and we ultimately get uh, nanoparticles of sizes close to uh, one dimension, close to a uh, few nanometer, and the average uh, uh, dimensions uh, up to a few uh, hundred nanometers. This is a particle size analyzer, which gives a very uh, rough idea of it takes all average of all the particles, but there are many particles which are smaller in size. This is another uh, crystal PM and PT, which we have used as a uh, crystal also. Uh, and uh, we have used them uh, to crush and get nanoparticles of uh, PM and PT. Uh, these uh, uh, are the highest uh, value of uh, D33, uh, almost close to uh, 2000 picocoulomb per meter. So it means it is almost 1000 times more efficient than normal uh, quartz crystal. Now, uh, if we get a nanoparticles of different material, how to go for the actual device? Uh, this is actually uh, PDMS is the organic. Uh, binder, you can say. Uh, this is a, a very slightly piezoelectric also. And we put the nanoparticles here, then uh, the magnetic stirrer, and then put uh, uh, on uh, RTO or PET substrate, and then uh, put, drop this material over it and uh, get a uh, structure, something like this. From top and bottom, we have electrodes, and we have our material embedded inside in between. And then uh, there are another techniques how to make uh, electrical contacts. And we are having a uh, nanogenerator. Of course, the size of this whole thing is 
uh, about one centimeter to one centimeter on one side, two centimeter on this side. But the particles we are actually responsible for output will be nanoparticles. Uh, one photograph to show uh, that if I have a uh, thick tape like this uh, in uh, a high uh, microscope, we can find out these particles which are uh, almost uh, almost uh, distributed. They are not uh, almost uh, density of these particles at this reason, this reason, this reason are more or less. And you can find that these particles are. Uh, Come to the conclude in two three minutes. Two four Please. minutes is okay. Huh? So the application is uh, that if uh, there are many devices uh, used for uh, video electricity, if we can replace the high uh, performance uh, material by other particles which is existing, we can uh, increase the efficiency of your uh, devices. Uh, this is very handmade uh, system. Uh, it is a uh, normal uh, tapping key in MSC labs. And if you put our uh, material inside, this is Jadano uh, device, and uh, put a finger pressure, you are getting 68 uh, millivolt. And this electronic circuit, just to show that this particular power is can able to blow uh, some light. Now, uh, this is uh, the demonstration and working of our uh, nano generators. Uh, if I put a, this is, I have explained that how we make these things. If I put a pressure like this, finger pressure is equivalent to this much of 0.01. And uh, uh, we can put directly a ceramic also. Uh, this diagram shows, the, uh, shows a uh, nano generator, but these values are not for this. These values are when we are using directly a ceramic or directly a crystal as a bulk. Uh, so if I put a pressure on this, uh, these results pertain to this figure, but uh, we have done the same thing. You can find that if I am using a PM and PT ceramic, we are getting almost 14 volt. And if I put a PM and PT single crystal directly without any uh, contact or without any policies or without doing anything, just to put a crystal and put a pressure by hand, uh, we are getting almost 50 volts. This is open circuit voltage. Uh, then we have a uh, system to apply uh, different type of force from here. We put our, our device here and apply a force. This is the force DB. We can control the force. We can control the frequency. And we can do the nature of force also. It is sinusoidal or it is a tapping force or it is thermal variation. So we can apply different type of force and we can show you the results. Uh, that if I apply, I'm applying a force like this, 0.4 kg to 1.4 to 2, you see that the voltage is going up by uh, from 3.6 voltage up to 60 voltage when we apply higher and higher force. Uh, the frequency is kept as one. Uh, then uh, we go for uh, another study. Uh, this is uh, the study in which uh, we have changed the composition of nanoparticles and PDMS. And for different uh, systems, we find that this value of uh, this uh, ratio of material, piezoelectric nanoparticles and PDMS, uh, change in this ratio will give you different type of outputs. And this is very interesting. Uh, just to, because people ask that if you can, uh, you are striking your uh, material, how many times you can strike? And whether it can sustain 100, 200, 300, or 1,000 times or not. So we can we have done this thing more than 5,000, 6,000 times because uh, number of times we try, number of times we take the readings, and after that also we repeat the thing. And uh, in one uh, uh, picture, we can uh, capture the uh, frequency, uh, the number of times which is equal to 700. So we have captured one uh, picture on our uh, CRO. You can find that this is almost constant. This is output voltage. I have just uh, enlarged this thing. You can find this voltage is almost constant uh, by a very large number of applications. Uh, maybe this is one uh, last slide from my side. Uh, this is the latest one. Uh, this is a terbium dome cadeno and the same. And you find that in this case, we have obtained uh, 
I'm not explaining these things. These are the electrical characterization uh, optimal. And I'm getting uh, different voltage 5.6 to uh, 8 or 9 volts in this particular case. Uh, so we have demonstrated uh, as a conclusion that we have made uh, different type of nanoparticles, uh, different type of ceramics. Uh, they are very high for foreign material in single crystals by different techniques. And these materials are used to uh, prepare thick tapes and for pressure sensor and brilliant energy harvesting. Finally, I would like to thank um, all my students who have done this work uh, in the past many years and my collaborator. Uh, of course, DSD, DRDO, UGC, on various projects, particularly on nanoparticles and uh, uh, energy harvesting application. In last, uh, I welcome particularly all Indian students who are listening that if you want to visit, if you want to do some work in our lab, you are most welcome. And there is no administrative hurdle. You can just walk in, in my lab and I will help you doing some work. If you want to learn, it is okay. If you want to do some research work, that is more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Binay Kumar, for nice presentation. Uh, anybody, if you uh, want to ask question, Varsa, Varsa is raising it. Okay. Unmute her. Yes, she's unmute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, indeed, it was a very interesting talk about piezoelectric materials and the application. So, actually, my question is uh, about uh, the. So, you have used the mechanical force. Have you used the thermal force also? Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, very good question. Uh, I have not included it. Actually, there is an effect pyroelectricity. In yes, the yes. Pyroelectricity, uh, we have actually excluded all those results. Uh, what okay. we, are, we have a uh, pyroelectric uh, uh, system, characterization system by radiant, and we have very, uh, I mean, almost equal work on pyroelectricity also because these okay. materials are very good pyroelectric. So yep. we put the material uh, in uh, varying temperature. So when temperature is changing, this is another effect. This is not piezoelectric. Pyroelectric means when we change the temperature, during exactly. the change in temperature, we will get the output voltage. So these all these materials are extremely good pyroelectric materials. Uh, uh, the so pyroelectric, my, uh, my second question here is the temperature. Can you uh, can we do it like what temperature is needed? Is the finger tip is sufficient? Or we need high temperature. Uh, actually, in uh, this is a good question. I cannot answer very uh, because we have not done it. But uh, this is not the temperature which is important. Of course, temperature range is important. This is the change in temperature which is more important for generation of exactly. electric energy. So uh, exactly. we have not. Uh, uh, so uh, in various materials. Uh, the, the change in temperature has different slopes. For example, if I go for a room temperature to 60 or 70 degree, it has a one particular slope. And if mm. you increase 70 degree to 200 degrees, the mm. slope is different. Slope of polarization versus temperature. Accordingly, the okay. energy uh, just, are different. OK. So just last question, because I'm working on nano devices, and you are saying these are the nano uh, energy harvesting systems. So um, if if we consider that uh, the your system is uh, let's say uh, 50 by six, uh, 50 micrometer by 10 micrometer by 60 uh, 600 nanometer, do you think that the force uh, applied force? What kind of applied force you will need to your system? Uh, uh, Again, because uh, I am saying that these are the nano particles and nano devices, but the dimensions of the device, the whole device, yeah. is in our case, in centimeters. Of course, the particles yeah. which are okay. in yeah. the row is uh, uh, of 100 to 200 or 300 nanometers. They are smaller also, up to 70, 80 also. Uh, but uh, we have, we do not have actually uh, 
the technology to make a device of micrometer size. So uh, I, I so actually. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so actually, because we are making this device, what we are having problem is measurement of, uh, I mean, electrochemical measurements for me is not a problem for such a small devices. But the main problem is the um, the to to see the force, you know, if I give some temperature. So do you think that if we make the device, you will be a small device, you will be able to uh, help us regarding uh, the measurements? In one way, I just something has flashed to my mind that if we are able to uh, to make a micrometer size, not exactly micrometer because uh, maybe uh, fifty or hundred micrometer size. Yeah. And, and we are able to put uh, a large number of such devices on a single uh, platform because the force which we are uh, applying with our instrument. Uh, is uh, uh, one or two millimeter size. So uh -huh. in that case, probably we can have some output and we can apply. Reasonable. And we put large number. Okay. Okay. Not for the single device. Uh, but okay. not for the single one. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. I do not. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. It was very interesting. Yeah. So, Doctor Chesa, now. Um. Yeah, now we were supposed to have um, our speaker, uh, the address, let me, let me share my screen that we, um, so. so thank you very much, huh? I'm, oh. okay, so we have uh, the address, should be delivered by our huh. director of uh, division director, Dr. Nicoletta Hickman. Uh, since uh, she is out of town, she cannot make it for today's meeting. Um, I would like to, Dr. Hickman is our division director and uh, she oversees the division with uh, managing the three departments of mathematics, natural sciences, and uh, history, humanities and social sciences. Uh, I have two of my colleagues in here in this meeting. I want them to represent for Dr. Hickman. Uh, Professor Ajit Kaushik will talk about the university and um, uh, talk about his perspective in terms of our uh, and uh, Emma Delden Ford, the faculty for Dr. Hickman. Hello. Please, Dr. Kaushik. Am I audible? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, good morning. Yes, you are audible. Okay, this is really uh, a great uh, moment for me to introduce my university to very well-known and experts in material science. So, uh, as Dr. Sesha mentioned that we are at Florida Polytechnic University. This is a very brand new University of Florida State, which has main focus on producing next generation engineer. So, so far, our, our focus is mainly engineer oriented education, mainly in electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, computer science, and aspects of uh, material science or chemistry, which is the major focus of uh, Department of Natural Sciences. And we are very fortunate to have Dr. Shesha as the chairman of Department of Natural Science. In his leadership, we are focusing on a lot of stuff, mainly, mainly like how we can do something new using the basic stuff which can bring a change in engineering education because our, our target is undergraduate and we don't have so far master program and PhD program. 
So this is this became very essential for us to give quality education at fundamental level so that our student can compete wherever they go in the world. So keeping this in view, uh, our D division is selecting very, very important aspects of education, keeping, keeping, the, keeping uh, or considering fundamental education as well as world-class training as well as the research facilities. So we are trying to make a balance where students know basic education, their skill set should be at very advanced level, and they should be trained to compete anywhere in the world. So we are very fortunate to have very fantastic support of our president, Dr. Randy Avent. He's a visionary, dynamic personality. He tried to bring new stuff to the university. After this, our provost, Dr. Terry Parker, is also a very, very good uh, scientist and, and a leader. He is giving everything to us so that we can do needful, which we require to compete as well as bring new domain to our university. And then after the leadership of Dr. Nikolita Hickman is really fantastic. She is a bridge between us and the president office. And she's also a very good physicist who is uh, working in graphene based one dimensional nanostructure for energy applications. So, and because of our leadership, we are having new courses in our department, which has focus on engineering, physics, and medicine. And we have new courses which are oriented on biophysics and, and, and medicine, medicine side. Also mm -hmm. the focus. Ajit, can you please uh, go over with the conference? How is your view and how we can collaborate? Just wrap it up so we can go to Ignard. This is, this is my, uh, I would say, next moment uh, of discussion because this conference is very fantastic, which gives me a very good feel about understanding new aspects of material science, different uh, uh, tools that can be introduced to our, to our syllabus and which will be useful to have new domain of research or different areas that will be useful for the training of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fuad. He is our physics professor and theoretical physicist. Uh, professor Fuad, can you please uh, share your views? Uh, great. Good morning, everyone. And actually, it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone over all the world. It's actually uh, on behalf of Dr. Professor Heckman, I would like to express our sincere uh, thanks and gratitude for all attendees. Especially Dr. Noam Vixi and the Dr. Sakla, and uh, actually Dr. Sisha and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, K. Verma, they work on like 24 7 to perform with this conference. And as you see, all it's actually over all the world and it's well arranged. And especially, by the way, in this uh, pandemic of COVID 19, we are really in need of the research and the data and the research. We hope sooner to get uh, like vaccination for COVID-19. And this is a special tool for how to treat uh, the whole world. So really, uh, we express our thanks for all attending over all the world. Thank you for everyone. And as you see today, it was the first day that was well uh, performed and it's excellent. So we hope to enjoy the other, the rest of the two days. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sitter. Thank you, Dr. Sitter. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, uh, the closing remarks and some housekeeping for tomorrow. Um, uh, I have received so many requests from the attendees that can we share the slides uh, for the professor's talk slides to all the attendees. Um, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I don't have any control on that slide sharing. The reason is all the uh, presenters uh, shared from their end, like they didn't. Uh, we can request from the professors after getting their approval and after getting their slides to us, 
we can definitely uh, put it in the mass email to all the attendees. So that's a, one of the requests. Uh, we cannot make it that happen tonight because some of you ask that it has to need uh, you need immediately, but nothing will be immediate. It will be by end of the conference. We will request all the professors to share their uh, presentation slides so that we can share it to the whole as a, a, a compliment for this conference. The second question is some of you have some requests for the professors. You want some resources to use like facilities to use. Please have con contact the particular professor. I got professor Binay Kumar, sir. Somebody asked that can we use your uh, lab uh, since we don't have a facility to make a dope uh, two to six com semiconductor compounds. So if you have, if you know that presentation uh, presenter and if you know their email address or talk to us, we will provide you. So you directly contact with that uh, as a conference organizers. We don't want to commit anything. At the same time, we want to help. Uh, to make sure that you get all the necessary information. Um, yes, Dr. Kareji, do you have? Yes, I mean, to this point, I want to um, suggest something that yes. maybe not, not the whole presentation can be shared, yes. but uh, some slides can be shared because right. uh, sometimes the results are confidential and we are not right. able, we have not published yet. So exactly. I think that can we can do like that. Exactly. So that that's all. Uh, up to the presenter who can give PDF file of whatever they want to show as a public. So nothing should be proprietary. You should go into that. Then we can put it into a, Dr. Verma can send it to the WhatsApp or probably email uh, with all the presentation or we can create a Dropbox for that purpose. But that could be done only after three days. And I also wanted your participation. We started with 150 to 160 participants, but now I see only 120 ish. So we wanted the maximum participation so that everyone can get benefited from the all the illuminating talks um, for tomorrow. Uh, again, I request Dr. Professor Manoj Dixit, sir, uh, to give a um, greeting so that we can record his uh, greetings for the for our records um, then we'll go dr uh, professor verma will introduce the conference welcome it and we have professor varsha kare uh, will be talking on challenging in uh, challenges in materials development for 3d and 4d printing possibilities for ai and dr ajit kaushik will be talking about Magnetic uh, electric uh, nanoparticles for personalized healthcare management, including Zika virus and uh, COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, Rajesh Kumar from IIT Indore will be speaking about Raman effect from scattering to spectroscopy and beyond. Uh, then Professor uh, Manoj Gupta from AMPRI Bhopal, India will be discussing piezoelectric nanostructures for flexible and transparent nano generator and applications, which probably advanced version. Uh, Professor Binay Gupta Kumar sir and uh, Dr. Manoj Gupta will work together. So uh, that's a great talk with adding more details into that concept. Uh, then our professor, I will check with the professor Nicoletta Hickman will be talking on the pristine graphene and um, graphene oxa, graphene derivatives for electrochemical sensors and biosensors. Then we'll conclude tomorrow, but tomorrow is a packed session. I want everyone to be uh, keep your scientific interviewing so that we can have more interaction in this uh, session. With that, uh, I would like Dr. KK Verma to close the meeting today. Uh, kindly unmute uh, Anil Kumar. Uh, oh. He will say something. Sure, he is unmuted. about this first day. He uh, Doctor Anil Kumar, say a few words. Welcome to all the presenters, presenters and uh, conveners of the conference. There are more important lectures with you tomorrow, and very important lectures are 
presented by the professor vinay kumar and uh, the introductory mm -hmm. remarks by professor sesha srinivasa and adit mohte we will meet tomorrow with new lectures and new directory and new dimensions of the material research thank you okay thank you dr anil kumar he is organizing secretary from yes. our side mm -hmm. uh, now everybody can leave sesa just stay okay, golden, golden. Yeah. thank okay, you very thank much you. Uh, thank you thank you very everybody. interesting talks <laughs> thank you At bye least we could get to see you <laughs> <laughs> And me too. I mean, I'm so happy to see you both <laughs> and Anchal. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, Bye. Uh, Bye. Thank you. Nice the thing, sir. Yeah, and thank you. Today you have kept the timings tight. Yes. And it's very important because. Yeah, actually, guys, the thing is, you all talk uh, 30 minutes. I could talk only 15 minutes. I don't know why. I, I just went fast. I was so nervous that I had to take <laughs> up so many things. I got yeah. only 20 minutes. Uh, but for you, this is the first time I have seen that uh, uh, the example of leading from the front because right. you are the organizer and you have given the first talk. It is now, very, Professor uh, K.K. Varmati, he is my senior and he uh, was uh, taking all the time. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll see you and tomorrow. I was, and I was very happy to know that you are a student of uh, Owen Srivastava. Yes, yes, oh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm sir. Uh, normally in touch with him. Uh, right. Uh, my supervisor and one Swasta was very Yeah, yeah. Uh, the professor Nalika should uh, always come to BHU and then we had so much interaction with him. Or Binay Kumar, Mera Langotia Yar hai. We used to play cricket in 10th class. <laughs> I see. That's good. Uh, when we use this platform, we should take uh, at least 10 minutes to in, uh, interact informally uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because yeah. many people uh, I'm interacting for the first time. So No, actually, uh, I, I started at 5 o'clock because last night I went to bed at 12 o'clock and started at 4, 4 4.30. So uh, <laughs> I open for uh, KK Varmaji uh, till 5. My time is 5, 5 a.m. Yeah. So yeah, you are right. We need uh, tomorrow. We can start early. Tomorrow but, uh, you are at three p.m. Must compliment. I can I can start uh, thirty minutes early so that we can we can just chat informally. Yes, send a link in such a way that there should not be any password. Anybody okay. can just join by clicking the link. I will remove the password. I will yeah, remove uh, this. Uh, uh, might have created hurdle in joining uh, okay. uh, by the okay. participants. I will change that. I will remove uh, the password. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, in case of panelists also, uh, there was some problem. Anjal mm -hmm. could not join. Uh, he joined uh, as, a, as an attendee. Yeah, that's very surprising to me. Um, um, the on the other day he joined as a panelist <laughs> yeah i will i will remove anything password then i will just leave it open okay thank you now you thank can you. leave yeah i can stop and the recording it. but aap ye ye, dr manoj this is uh, say ki kal aake wo bashan de. okay yeah. you have sent link na yeah, no, I did not. I am going to send link after after our conference. I am going to send for day two link. Okay. But uh, you can tell him that can he spend five minutes uh, so that I can record it, record his speech again. I will try. Oh, why, sir? <laughs> he is very busy person. <laughs> Okay, Tina. Okay, sir. Okay. But I want this recording uh, to take care. Okay. All right.
Thank you. Okay, and now you can leave. Your I son is waiting it. behind you. Say hi to her. Say namaskar. Wow. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'll stop the recording. Two hours, 54 minutes. I'll stop the recording.